Welcome to your April 2024 astrology overview that we can all collectively relate to. I'm going to share some standout details with you, but please stay with me. I will explore in great depth all the key influences and timings to share with you. Underneath this video, you can check out your deep dive horoscope forecast for April from Aries through to Pisces in terms of your ascendant, the sun or the moon. If you are new to my channel, it's lovely to have your company. I interact with all comments, so if you have any thoughts, please share them. If you're a returning visitor, thank you so much for joining me once more. If you've yet to subscribe to my channel, I'd be honoured if you did so now. Please click or tap on the bell notification symbol, so every time I drop a video, you will get an alert. So on the screen now, I'm sharing the event chart right at the start of the month. We have a collective of energy in Pisces, but also in Aries, we have that dynamic duo in Taurus of Jupiter and Uranus, which come together in an exact conjunction on the 21st. But if you see that icon of the moon and the sun together, that's the midpoint of the position of the sun at 11 degrees and 45 in Aries, and the moon at 27 degrees and 45 in the free spirited sign of Sagittarius. But the midpoint between them is positioned in Aquarius at 19 degrees. We've also got Pluto in Aquarius. So ever th since the 21st of January, and we initially had the Sun, then Mercury, then Venus, then Mars, all going through Aquarius, there's been a lot in the developing narrative about how we're connected to one another, but also some very futuristic stuff unfolding. And the position of the midpoint therefore tells us that over the month of April, how we are connected, but also our future hopes, are very much central to the overall theme, despite the fact that the Sun initially is in Aries, and then on the 19th makes its way into the sign of Taurus. But also that midpoint is clashing with the position of Uranus and also clashing with Jupiter. So they're in the second house, the position of the midpoint and Pluto in the 11th house, the collective. This suggests that financially things are going to be potentially quite turbulent in in the month of April, or else it could be how we earn a living or how we confirm our identities because the second house is very much about our values. Now, the position of Mars, Saturn, the part of Fortune, Venus and Neptune, all in Pisces is very creative, particularly the last three, which are almost side by side, a terrific conjunction between the part of fortune and Venus in the 12th house means that if you are someone who has a lot of flair and interest in photography or film or music, performance, installations, you could find yourself absolutely inspired at the start of this month. But in a more personal context, we just have to be aware that the moon is squaring up to those three positions. And the moon in the ninth house has a tendency to amplify our emotions. The ninth house can exaggerate. Also, it can be a truth seeker. The twelfth house, particularly with Neptune in the mix, can be where things are concealed, mysterious, or not quite obvious. And clearly the moon is in a direct square with Neptune. So I feel there could be some confusion this month. And however much we're trying to hunt down the reality, it may just seem a little bit out of reach. But that brings us to the lineup of planets. And the Sun, for sure, is in Aries, and Mercury on the first day goes into a retrograde. It's going to emerge on the 25th, but it starts at 27 degrees in Aries. At the end of the retrograde, it's at 15 degrees and 58 minutes. It lasts for 23 days. The host, Aries, is hot, can be impulsive and impatient. Mercury in Aries likes to tell it as it is, quickly. So it's possible that by being quite impetuous in our thinking or our actions or our speaking, that that could cause some issues. But there's such a lot of positive potential 
that's coming into the sign of Aries, we need to be aware that what Mercury may be trying to teach us in the sign of Aries in retrograde is to think again, to revisit things that haven't worked very well in the past, and it may be it's time for some new starts. Now, also on the third, Venus has moved forwards and is in a beautiful alliance with Neptune. If you are lucky enough to have met someone recently and it really is going superbly well between you, this can be quite enchanting. But of course, Neptune, the planet of illusion applying to Venus, could trick us a little bit about someone's intentions or even about our finances. So we just need to remind ourselves about that square with the moon at the start of the month. So something may develop that's not quite in view and that could be a feature for the whole of this month. But on the third, they are in a beautiful alliance. So if you are lucky enough to be connecting to someone and it feels right, it could be an aspect which really sets the scene for quite the relationship. But on the fifth, we have the advancing sun meets the retreating north node. Now, because at this exact degree, this hasn't happened for 18.6 years, it's a big deal. And if we think about the north node, it's almost like our collective direction of travel. And ever since the true node moved into Aries on the 13th of July, 2023, it's been encouraging us to really take our individuality, our identity, a lot more seriously because perhaps with the uh, advent of all the social media that we take part in, in some ways just interacting at a certain trivial level or sharing information to impress one another has seen us forget a little bit about the importance of self. I don't mean selfishness, I don't mean ego in a bad way, but just staying in tune with what's important for us and not getting caught up in being scattered by all the by all the external distractions that assail our senses all the time. It really can uh, deny us the chance to focus on what's really important. So the sun meeting the north node is a hugely symbolic moment for us all. Now, of course, it does depend where the north node is in your natal chart. And of course, it also depends on where your sun is. But on the same day, Venus moves forward out of the sign of Pisces and into the sign of Aries. Now, technically detrimented in Aries, but Venus in Aries has a lot of passion and desire. Venus is about relating, of course. It can be about peace, but critically, it can also be about money. But Venus forges a link to Pluto for the first time in over 220 years, Pluto in Aquarius. This is something I feel that's very much to do with how we all relate to one another. I think a new higher frequency can emerge, which gives us the chance to uplift us. And because it coincides with the sun's meeting with the North Node, I think this could be one of the most important days of the whole year. And of course, the big attention will probably be on Mercury's retrograde. So Mercury retrograde can create frustrations, blockages, delays, lost documents, computer failures, software uh, issues. And if we're traveling anywhere, misunderstandings, all the usual stuff that we get with Mercury retrogrades. But serious astrologers really like to promote the idea that Mercury retrogrades is a chance to reset, recalibrate, realign our approach. The first house for us all in Aries is the start of the journey of the Zodiac. So what can we freshen up within our own lives? Of course, it depends on where your ascendant, your sun and your moon are about how it will feel in a more intimate way. But certainly this is an opportunity with this cluster of energy that's so powerful to give ourselves a complete reset in terms of our outlook. And then that brings us to that glorious total solar eclipse, which is obviously going to be very impactful in the States in a physical sense, but it's within one minute of Chiron, the wounded healer. Now Chiron has a really unusual orbit. So a lot of people actually have uh, 
Chiron in Aries or Pisces, and very few people have it in Libra or Virgo. So it just depends on where it is for you, but there is a chance here to think about the concept of Chiron. Chiron was a trainer of the gods. There is a, 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 a view that you can never heal the wound of Chiron. But I think it's important to understand that Chiron is where we will shine. And it's just where we may not feel that we get much acknowledgement for the area that we're particularly skillful at. And we can work on that. It's not something that we can't keep re revisiting and, and learning about. Obviously, if you have Saturn or Pluto directly on your Chiron, it's going to be a much more challenging journey. I have Chiron conjunct the moon in the fourth house. That's quite tough, particularly opposite Uranus. So it just depends. We have to keep working at it. But over the next six months, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to think about how we dress, our individuality, our approach to situations, how much singular uh, energy can we apply when something really means a lot to us. Sometimes we do have to be really focused on what's important. If we're scattered the whole time being a people pleaser or following trends or worrying too much about what other people think, that is going to deny us from manifesting ourselves in the most authentic way. So such a huge opportunity for us all. Now from the 6th through to the 15th, there is a potential challenge because as Mars inches forwards and applies to the strict Saturn. Now we know that both these planets are not at their best in the sign of Pisces. Some people would argue because Mars is the traditional ruler of Scorpio that it's okay in the watery Pisces. Some people would say that Saturn in Pisces is part of an overall process that's come into its close of 29 and a half years, which is reminding us of the importance to work hard and be disciplined about the whole concept of feelings. You put the two together, if there is a sense of injustice or frustration or limitation or feeling that you can't get into that very dynamic energy that all this Aries stuff is throwing up, then it could see a need to let go of some of those frustrations. When Mars applies to Saturn, we can actually be extraordinarily self-disciplined and focused, but only if we narrow our focus. If we do too much, that's when the irritation can come in. And it's possible some very deep-seated emotions could blow up in quite a, a way through that series of days, week two. But also from the 10th to the 13th, the retreat in Mercury meets the advancing sun. It's exact in the Kazemi on the 11th. It's an inferior conjunction because we have the sun, then Mercury, then Earth. But the sun still amplifies the energy of Mercury. If things have been a bit helter-skelter, we've tried something, hasn't worked. And that can happen with Mercury, I feel, in the first house. We can initiate something new and then find, ah, that initial enthusiasm was a little bit not necessarily misguided, but it's not necessarily going to be sustainable. So then we have to adjust and flex and go again. But that's where the passion of Aries can be such a good thing. So I feel that if we do need to have a discussion, talk or, th or think, talk or thought Mercury about something that's fresh or we want to inject something that's important to us with more verve and vigour, this is a great time to do it. But it is true to say that Mercury then applies to Chiron, another opportunity to think about where we may have some wounds or some vulnerabilities, or we have self-limiting thinking, or things aren't quite flowing for us the way they could. We need to analyze it, the energy of the Virgo rulership of Mercury. The discussion comes from the Gemini rulership. But then from the 14th to the 19th, a quite brilliant, conjunction between Mercury and Venus, which peaks on the 19th. This is dazzling. As much as it can be argued that Venus is detrimented in Aries, it does have that pash because of the fire. So if there is someone that we really like, even if we're someone who may be a little bit shy or maybe someone in business we need to get in contact with, 
or some greater urgency needs to be showed in an existing relationship, something can break through. And this is going to be good after that dam that built up with Mars applying to Saturn, which may have created an enormous amount of frustration. But that brings us to the 19th, and this is a massive moment in the month because for sure the Sun moves into Taurus, so it's then about converting the ideas we've had into something that's more solid, has good foundations, that we're, we're building something up. We're not just speculating and enthusing about something, we're actually trying to find some, some uh, form. And that's really, really good. The problem is, that this sun clashes with Pluto. And it clashes with Pluto in a big way. Now this did actually happen last year. So this is the second time this has happened because if you remember Pluto was in the sign of Aquarius for 11 weeks from the 27th of March. So it's the second time we have this aspect. If you think back to then, something may have played out in your situation that could play out again here. So the sun in house two is about money but it's also about our self-worth, it's about foundations. But Pluto's in the most idealistic part of our overall charts, along with that midpoint, which of course clashed with Jupiter and Uranus right at the start of the month. So that turbulence that I said was possible could come through even with Jupiter and Uranus coming into the exact conjunction on the 21st. They are supported by Mars. Mars in the 12th house in Pisces could mean that things that have been fermenting in the background for a long time can connect in terms of people's view. So we could see a lot of public demonstrations about unfairness, about the cost of fuel, the cost of food. We may see uh, farmers protesting. I feel that Jupiter conjunct Uranus is going to be a lot about people finding their voices but particularly because the sun in that position is squaring with Pluto. And Pluto is about the collective. So where the collective isn't happy, it's got to find its voice. And of course, at this stage, Mercury is still in a retrograde and perhaps deeply frustrated. That brings us to the full moon in the passionate sign of Scorpio, the most intense full moon of the whole year. Guess what? It T squares to Pluto. Because that's shared finances and where we connect to others in a very close, intimate or devotional way, Scorpio. We have Taurus's everyday finances, but also about our personal values and our self-worth. But Pluto again is intersecting with them. I feel there could be some turbulence around financial markets around that time, to be honest. Mercury does go direct on the 25th and we see Venus join up with uh, the Sun, Jupiter and Uranus on the 29th and Venus obviously loves being in the sign of Taurus but it's challenged by Pluto. So what Pluto does is bring some politics to the party. Venus ordinarily moving into Taurus would be good for financial markets and maybe there will be a greater amount of awareness by this stage of the month. Mars applies to Neptune in the last few days of the month and is going to be bursting into its home sign of Aries as the month comes to an end and we go into May, which is extremely dynamic, but potentially uh, quite hot. You know, Mars moving into Aries suggests any simmering frustration that's around at the end of the month will have to find an outlet. So my proposition is that having Jupiter and Uranus on the 21st coming together, but supported by Mars can be good, but it's asking all of us to look afresh at how we use resources. Of course, Jupiter can be about borders, Uranus can be about sudden moves, and the sign of Taurus can be about land. Are we going to see some more turbulence in terms of international affairs? It's possible, um, but I feel that Venus squaring Pluto in a personal context, if you're in a relationship where you feel that there is a lot of power games, jealousy, control, manipulation, all that stuff that's more about the dark arts, you could become much more conscious of breaking free. So as much as the sign of Taurus can be about stability and our appreciation because it's a fixed sign of the foundations we have, I think all of our foundations are being shook 
because we're all realizing with the advance of technologies, whether it is AI, robotics, automation, um, but also the power that big corporations have, unless we're talking about the Chinese and the Russian governments, perhaps to some degree the Iranian and Saudi Arabian governments, they have quite big power, don't they? But a lot of other governments don't seem to be able to control the power of a lot of big players, particularly in the digital media sphere. So I feel that we're going to become much more aware collectively of the imbalance. And this is what Pluto in Aquarius is asking us to become more conscious of. So that's why I feel that people will be finding their voices a lot more as this month comes to an end in terms of speaking out against what they see as injustice, unfairness, but also realizing we are so connected to one another. And as much as it may be okay for some people, there's a lot of people that are feeling a collective misery and pain because of a lot of the attritional behavior that's going on at governmental level, but also the helplessness we feel because of these big corporations. So I feel the human dimension is really gonna be bursting through at the end of this month in a massive way. Now, please check out your in-depth zodiac sign from Aries through to Pisces. But if you would like to ascend and embrace more serious astrology, if you give me three pieces of personal birth data of time, date and place, I can produce for you your life roadmap report. This will give you searing insights into the patterns that have played out in your life so far and a much more intimate understanding of how to work with them more successfully going forwards. In my special package of 30% off, you can also get your 12 month transits forecast. That's the moving planets in the sky interacting with your unique blueprint. Now, if you've had your natal package, you can get your draconic package, which is based on moving your north node to north degrees areas. This is very much your karmic soul chart, but you can still get a 12 month forecast of that as well. If you don't know your time, you can also order your solar package and also take advantage of the same two concepts. Please see the link below for more. So Aries on the screen now, you can see the event chart for the very start of the month. Now you'll notice on this that Mercury doesn't show RX next to it, which means retrograde. It's because the retrograde happens later on on the first day. But the big takeout is the moon. It's in your sister fire sign of uh, Sagittarius at 27 degrees 45. But the critical factor is that it is in a square with Neptune. And you can see that Neptune and Venus are very close together as you come into the month of April. So there may be a very tender emotional or relationship issue that you are processing. It's possible that someone has really captured your imagination, but you're not quite sure how this will pan out. What I will say to you is that having uh, the moon square in Neptune can create a degree of amplification in terms of your sensitivities right through April. So it is going to be important at times when you are feeling perhaps a little bit threatful or maybe even frustrated that you do remember that the moon in Sagittarius is very much a truth seeker. And if something does seem a little distorted or someone seems a bit evasive, or not quite responding in the way you want. It's certainly something you're not imagining. But you can also see Aries that the part of fortune is very close to Venus. Something you've worked hard on over many months before could come to fruition this month and it may be to do with money. Because Venus isn't just about relating, it is about uh, lucre as well. And maybe this project or situation has been something that you've been working behind the scenes on. But you can see that your ruler Mars is pretty close to Saturn at the start of this month. And in week two, they do come into a conjunction. Now, during that week, despite the power of the total solar eclipse in your sign, it may feel that there are still some legacy issues that you do need to clear up. 
and it's important to be mindful of those if things are not quite flowing forwards as quickly as you would like. And of course one of the reasons for that could be the Mercury retrograde. I want to reassure you, Mercury in the sign of Aries is very much about quick action. So it's almost inevitable that if something doesn't quite go as you hope, you're going to take another action that's just as quick in order to dart in a different way. So there may be a series of pauses and, uh, and starts, but it's all for the greater good because by the time that Mercury emerges from its retrograde, which is going to be on the 24th, you're going to see that something that didn't quite work out for you, there was a bigger reason for it. But the great news is that after that magical alliance between Venus and Neptune, which could be that person who's showing in your life, perhaps in a subtle way, perhaps even someone that you've got to know uh, clandestinely, or has it been the case that you've had to come to terms with some kind of separation? Either of those scenarios are possible, but by the fifth, as Venus bursts into your sign, okay, it's technically debilitated in Aries, but I actually love Venus in Aries in people's natal charts because I feel it gives them a lot of pluck. The whole thing with Venus through its rulership of the sign of Libra is about diplomacy, but sometimes that diplomacy can be a little bit or seem to be a little bit superficial, whereas in your sign there's much greater urgency. So if there is someone that you're interested in developing the relationship with, the link between Venus and Pluto, the first for over 200 years, could be life-changing. So I feel what's happening at the start of this month is that yes, there is one foot very much in the present, in terms of the Sun, Mercury, the North Node and Chiron, but Mercury retrograde suggests that there could be some rethinking. The gathering of energy, including your ruler Mars, very close to Saturn, and also Venus, very close to Neptune, being squared up by the Moon in Sagittarius at the start of the month, suggests that some delicate issues may need to be processed right at the start of April. But I feel that Venus moving into your sign really starts to see you travel forwards, despite Mercury suggesting that there may be some rethinking. But then that glorious total solar eclipse of the 8th, just one minute apart from Chiron. It's very important to understand that Chiron is an influence that we can make work for us very effectively. If you do feel, and obviously Chiron in your natal chart may not be in Aries, and it may not be in the first symbolic house. But if you feel that your Chiron influences are not quite resolved in your life, and some astrologers claim you can never solve them, I feel the key is to understand that Chiron in Aries is very much about our identity. It's about a self-belief in what we're trying to achieve. But you've had some big energies going on over the last year because Saturn joined up with Neptune in your 12th house. And I feel that something that has worked very, very well for you for a long time has in some ways come to a close. And it may not have been a, a totally chosen closure. It may have been something that seemed beyond your control. So what's happening is if there is any emotional debris still outstanding from that event, you're going to have to deal with it. And Chiron is saying, dealing with that wound, the quicker you can look at it in the face, the quicker you can move on. But because your ruler Mars is aligning to Saturn from the 6th to the 15th and becomes exact on the 10th, if something really feels oppressive, it could be a sore point. So I feel a lot of astrologers will claim that this solar eclipse in your sign gives you enormous power to go forwards as an individual, but it is so important to understand that so those painful things that have been unfolding, or that greater psychological emphasis in your situation over the last year, is something you still need to hold. And the more you bring it into your situation, the better. Now we do have from the 10th to the 13th, Mercury aligning with the Sun and they become exact on the 11th and this is a Kazemi but it's an 
inferior conjunction. That means because of Mercury's retrograde, it sat in between uh, the Earth and the Sun. But it still magnifies, the Sun still magnifies uh, Mercury. So what we're saying here is if you are finding yourself rethinking something, or perhaps deciding that something that was ongoing is no longer viable and you need to go in a new direction, that's all part of a natural process that you're, uh, you're addressing. And that actually, particularly with the symbolism in week one of the sun being aligned with the North Node, suggests that some kind of big relaunch is taking place within you. And you're having to sift through what was really important and what now is more to do with your past and come more into the present. So that is such an enormous opportunity for you. So see this as a, as a chance for healing. And that becomes particularly so when Mercury comes into a conjunction with Chiron on the 13th. Now the other big news story of this month is that Jupiter and Uranus are in a conjunction for the whole month within three degrees and that comes up to the boil on the 21st, but they're both also arcing to Mars in Pisces. Mars is shrugged off the more limiting energies of Saturn by this time. And again, something that you put an awful lot of effort into in the past could then reap you a reward. And it could be quite unexpected how this plays out. And it can happen very quickly. Uranus in the mix is a very electric, fast-moving energy. So that in itself, very exciting. But that brings us to the full moon, which occurs on the 23rd. And that is afflicted by Pluto. So that's why in terms of your financial situation, because the moon's in Scorpio, which is the most passionate full moon of the year, and it's very much to do with where you're most connected, but where you're most devoted. But it can also be where you're most invested. And Pluto, again, is saying, look, I'm in the most idealistic part of your situation, the one that's to do with your future hopes. Is the way that you're balancing this financial situation, even if you've had this big bonus ball that's come up on the 21st, are you satisfied with the way this is unfolding? And once more, I feel that there could be a choice and that choice could have some moral uh, significance in some ways in terms of what you feel most comfortable with. But on the 25th, Mercury goes direct and it does go into its post-retrograde shadow. It's at 16 degrees now and it's going to be in the post-retrograde shadow pretty well through to the middle of May, the 13th of May. So things that you've been sorting out and realigning may still take a little bit of time to really get to the biting point of what you want. But on the 29th, the great news is that that financial opportunity that started to manifest itself on the 21st really starts to produce in a much more tangible way because Venus returns home to Taurus but that's going to be one of the most brilliant moments of the whole month for you. Also your rule on Mars as it comes to the end of April it's coming to the end of its journey in Pisces and as you go into May it is going to move into your sign. So some big shifts are going on this month for you Aries some of it is psychological, some of it is clearing up some of the things that have been going on in a very powerful way, particularly over the last year because of Saturn. Because of the Mercury retrograde, something that you think at the start of the month is going to go in a particular way could ebb in a different direction. There is huge opportunities to reset your purpose on that solar eclipse in terms of how you can showcase what makes you truly special. And there is a lot of blessings this month coming with the help of Mercury and Venus and the Sun as they each apply to the Node and Chiron. So your chance to show who you are is going to give you a transformation, a huge transformation, but there may be two really major choices that you have to make. But I think financially by the end of the month and in terms of your sense of self, you're going to feel so much more restored 
as April comes to a close. It's been a real pleasure being with you. Thank you so much for joining me. Please do like, comment, share or subscribe and check out your weekly video horoscopes as I launch them. So Taurus, as you come into April on the screen now, there is your event chart and you can see big cluster of energy in the sign of Pisces, very much about your friendships, your social connection, your long-term planning, your higher values, can be an area to do with good fortune. And you can see that the part of fortune is conjunct your ruler Venus. So there could be a stroke of luck linked to a group of people or one particular friend. But you've also got a cluster of energy in Aries, which is much more psychological, plus the key combination of Jupiter and Uranus in your sign, which will become exact in a conjunction on the 21st, but as it does, forges an amazing link with Mars. But the big other takeout is the position of the moon because that's squaring with Neptune. And that suggests that as much as one person or one group of people could be inspirational, there could be someone else, perhaps someone you're drawn to romantically, who could turn out not to deliver in the way you're hoping at the start of the month. Now let's think first of all about the role of Mercury because it starts this month in Aries but then later on on the first day goes into a retrograde. A retrograde in the 12th house is very psychological. If we think about the 12th house as being akin to Pisces, Mercury doesn't like being in Pisces because it's detrimented, it's watery, it diminutes its logic and its detachment which it gets from its two other rulers of Gemini and Virgo. So you've got a bit of a challenge there to be honest and then the Sun is aligning with the North Node in your 12th house that becomes exact on the 5th and then your ruler Venus moves into that area as well. So quite quickly three events happen which could test your faith. It's possible because of that conjunction between the part of fortune, Venus and Neptune, that something quite incredible could happen in a positive way this month. But because of that moon position, what you've got to do to protect yourself is use the moon energy in the sign of Sagittarius, which is a truth seeker, but in the eighth house to dive deep. So in other words, don't take anything at face value. And it's going to be really important for you to understand the psychological dimension of your life, your connection to others, but also your relationship to your own fears and anxieties, which is what the 12th house is about. So Mercury going retrograde there suggests that maybe there are some things or some insights you can gain about uh, the way you look at things that maybe is a bit tough to, to accept. Also the Sun aligning with uh, the North Node, ever since the North Node moved on the 13th, the true no North Node, in the 13th of July 2023 into your 12th house, where you had really been attacking things with gusto for a couple of months with Jupiter's help, when Jupiter moved in the middle of May in your sign, suddenly you were finding that things weren't quite accelerating at the pace you liked. Of course, Saturn had moved into your sector of friendship in the March, so there's been a shift that's gone on in the last six or nine months, which hasn't always been very easy for you. And I feel that what we're dealing with this month, particularly by the fifth when Venus moves into your 12th house and aligns with Pluto, you're being asked to really try to understand, particularly your professional connections, who's going to be with you and supportive of you and who's not. Because unfortunately, I think you may have some quite big experiences this month in understanding where you feel in some ways cut off, detached, maybe even a tenderness all the way to abandonment. Twelfth house is very delicate energy. So on the face of it at the start of the month, the bubbly conjunction between Jupiter and Uranus in your sign, the position of all those 11th house planets with the part of fortune with your ruler Venus, but actually because the shift into the 12th house and the emphasis on the 12th house is so quick 
and it's including very major aspects. So, you know, the Sun aligning with the North Node is one of the most incredibly important aspects you can have. Think back 18.6 years ago and you would have had a repeat of the same aspect. Um, also, because of Venus moving into the 12th house, that can be about when things come to a natural close in relationships. It can be where we feel more sentimental, more nostalgic. We could reconnect to someone from our past, an old flame, but just be aware of or just consider why the relationship ended the first time around. But because Venus is in such a powerful angle with Pluto in your sector of success, when it comes to your professional situation, you do need to be aware of the politics. Not everyone is necessarily going to express an open opposition to what you want to achieve, but you may feel the psychological coldness there. Then we get the solar eclipse, which occurs on the 8th. This is conjunct to all but one minute with the wounded healer Chiron. So huge energy this is, and it provides a backdrop for the next six months. If there is anything from your past that is outstanding in terms of hurts, disappointments, separations, betrayals, this is a solar eclipse which asks you to really look them directly in the eye. And that's not easy. It's also possible that, you know, if you're in a relationship where you feel your partner is not particularly supportive or psychologically in tune with you, you may start to rethink whether it's the right relationship for you. And there could be a big conversation that goes on in week two because by then Mars and Saturn come together in a conjunction. That's exact on the 10th. And that's really giving you a, a little bit more strength of purpose when it comes to asserting what you want from your future. And maybe you're going to tease someone out who has not been quite as supportive as they could have been. And maybe that conversation will go on between the 10th and the 13th. Because on the 11th, we have a Kazemi with the Sun and Mercury. But because Mercury is in a retrograde, it's what's known as an inferior conjunction the position of Mercury lies between the Sun and the Earth, but that really could see some information come to you. You could be told something, maybe you're going to rethink something from your past. Your psychological awareness can really grow at this time, but it may be a painful process to be really truthfully honest with you. But through this middle part of the month, there are things to be gained because Mercury applies to Chiron. Venus applies to the North Node, then applies to Chiron. Then Venus and Mercury come together. It's possible that you could actually have a conversation with someone that you strongly fancy, but maybe you'll want to keep it confidential between you. Possibly you will start to become more conscious of someone's energy and there could be some non-verbal communication going on, but a lot of fascination. But then when the sun moves into your sign, we get that repetition of the square with Pluto, which occurred in the third week of April last year. So the sun moving into uh, Taurus gives you more strength, more conviction, more determination. Because it's in that square with Pluto, you may find yourself coming into some kind of open opposition with people at work. And perhaps if you have felt disappointed, let down, unsupported in the way that you really wanted because of all that 12th house energy, it could be quite a sobering moment of the month as the sun does clash with Pluto. But by the 23rd, you're going to come into your power a lot more because then we have that conjunction between Jupiter and Uranus, but Mars in the sign of Pisces links brilliantly with them. If there are some people that you need to move on from, that's going to be a critical point. Also, Mercury goes direct on the 25th. And if you have been feeling, look, some situations have not been acceptable, even if it's painful, you will have started to accept the reality of the situation. But then on the 29th, Venus moves into your sign. 
And whatever has panned out earlier in the month, whether it, it is that you have that beautiful connection, which is possible because of the conjunction with Venus and Neptune and the part of fortune, or someone has hugely disappointed you, you're going to really be moving into your power. But it is true that Venus squares, like the Sun did, Pluto. And again, there could be some intensity, but I feel that rather than feeling more wounded or even rejected by how things are, or it could be you that's moving away from something that isn't working for you, you're actually telling someone powerfully what you expect and how it's been has not been acceptable to you. Now, on the very last day of this month, Mars comes to the end of its journey in your 11th house. So if there is a cutting point uh, in a relationship which you feel has run its course, it may be at the end of this month that it really becomes clear to you. So it's one of the most complex months I can remember for you for a very long time. I must stress it has those opportunities. The 11th house is about your long-term future. If you're very intact psychologically, you're going to be robust enough to deal with this month but you can't control other people. And the 12th house, which Mercury goes retrograde in, which we have uh, the conjunction between the Sun and the Node on the 5th, which your ruler Venus moves in to on the 5th through to the 29th, that is the sector in traditional astrology to do with secret enemies. And I think it could be around your professional situation as much as your personal situation that you learn an awful lot about who's for you, and who's not for you. But by the end of this month, even if some things and some people and some interests and some plans have to make way and you're heading in a bit of a different direction, you will be back in charge of the process. It's been a real pleasure being with you, Taurus. Thank you so much for joining me. Please do like, comment, share, or subscribe. So on the screen now, Gemini, there is your chart wheel and you can see that collective of energy including your ruler Mercury, Chiron, the North Node, the Sun all in the 11th house. But right at the top of the chart and particularly take note of Mars that's near to the 10th house cusp that's where you can be successful and having Mars in such a prominent position can give you more confidence to strut your stuff, raise your profile but I think it's going to be a case of who as much as what you know. And with Mercury going retrograde later on on the 1st, it just follows that some of the things that are going to inspire you at the start of the month might not quite work out exactly as you think. But then again, you could hear from someone from your past, reconnect, and actually by revisiting a topic, a strand, or something that's important to you, there can be a rejuvenation. Now, the other thing we need to be mindful of, the event chart, is the position of the moon. It's in a very diplomatic location, but it is squaring up to Neptune and Venus. But I want you to be particularly mindful of Neptune. Moon square Neptune can create confusion. There may be somebody that you need to deal with this month, and it could be a boss, a line manager, an, an owner, maybe in a bigger organisation, someone involved in human resources, who you may find to be a bit tricky to deal with. And the reason for this is they may not give you clear and consistent messages, which is something that you really appreciate. I also want to take you back to the very start of the year, because... Then we had Mercury, your ruler, in a retrograde and Mars very close to where the position of the moon is at the start of this month. And they were squaring up with Neptune too. So this potential for a little bit of confusion or uncertainty around your career or professional situation is something that can be a factor for the whole of 2024. However, what we can see from this chart is that Venus and the part of fortune are bound together by all but four minutes. So there could be good luck for you around your uh, career and professional situation, but just work extremely hard in terms of those interpersonal uh, exchanges and particularly around your personal communication. Now through the first 
five days of this month, uh, Venus and Neptune very close together. And of course, that can have implications for your love life. If you are really invested in a situation and it's going well, and you've got to know each other relatively recently, so perhaps over the last two or three years, you may be talking about that next level of commitment. And to be honest, Venus and Neptune in its most beautiful way can be one of the most inspiring of all aspects, but it can create some confusion. So just be aware that of what you're being told and scrutinizing it a little bit Fortunately, the North Node is reversing to meet with the Sun in your 11th house where Mercury is going retrograde and they become exact on the 5th, the very day that Venus moves out of the sign of Pisces and into Aries. Now in technical astrology, Venus is said not to be so good in the sign of Aries. But I feel in a natal chart, it gives someone more spark, more desire to go for what they need. And because Venus forges an instant brilliant angle to Pluto, the planet of transformation, it's possible that that relationship, whether it's professional or personal, that's inspiring you, but you've been a bit uncertain about what it's really about, you may get more clarity by the fifth, despite Mercury's retrograde, with the conjunction between the Sun and the North Node. Something could happen for you, particularly if you're a bit older, that has a reflection to something that happened around about 17 to 18 and a half years ago, the last time the North Node was going through Aries. But that uh, journey of Venus into that area that's to do with friendship can be very good if you are wanting to connect more with others. Or is it one person in particular? If you do find someone new, intriguing, it's probable that they're going to have knowledge or something about them in terms of cultural experience or travel that you find really exciting. But the new moon which occurs on the 8th is of course also a total solar eclipse. The third supermoon on the trot and that too is forging an amazing link to Pluto. But it's also within one minute of Chiron, the wounded healer. If you have found that friendships, connections to societies or groups, has been an area that's not always been easy for you, you may surprise yourself over the next six months and find that your ability to network, interact, see other people's viewpoints, but find ways to collaborate and cooperate can be an area that you can really thrive in but the key to it is believing that you're worthy of any developments that unfold. Now from the 10th to the 13th, the retreat in Mercury meets with the advancing Sun, and we have an exact Kazemi, or conjunction, an inferior conjunction, on the 11th. That's when the position of Mercury is in between the Sun and also Earth, but the Sun still magnifies the qualities of Mercury despite that retrograde. If you recall earlier, I said that there may be some kind of resumation in an old friendship, an old alliance, or perhaps you can find a, a way to look at an existing situation with a greater sense of clarity. Mercury retrogrades don't have to all be about glitches, problems, and delays. Now, of course, those are possible. All we can do is make sure the things we can control we're doing so precisely and efficiently. But if we're heading to the airport and we check that we've got our passport, our visa, we've had our inoculations, if we're going somewhere particularly exotic or off the beaten track, we can do all of those things. We can have our medicines in place, uh, all the different paperwork. But if we get to the airport and there's an industrial dispute, you can't control that. What you can control is anticipating that those things can happen. So make sure that you've got, you know, the necessary small bag with you that you can just be flexible around uh, keeping yourself uh, uh, clean and having some water and some food just in case that happens. So that's how we can work with Mercury retrogrades. But we are going to see on the 13th, a conjunction between Mercury and Chiron. 
If there is something that does need to be discussed of a delicate nature around a friendship, a collective, an association, this can be a key moment. Also from the 14th through to the 19th, a wonderful connection between Mercury and Venus. Is there somebody in your group situation who's really inspiring you to the point it's now becoming rather more to do with attraction. Sometimes a meeting of minds can lead to a more, uh, a more invested relationship at an attraction level, and that could be uh, stimulated at that point. Also, Venus comes into a conjunction with the node on the 17th and with Chiron on the 21st. These are all key dates because it's very much about how you think about your higher purpose and how you communicate it. The 11th house, the higher purpose, but it's also your long distance, your long distance plan, but it's also your associations, all really important. However, we do have a potential roadblock, to be honest, on the 19th, because at that point, the sun squares up with Pluto. So whereas the solar eclipse saw a terrific angle with Pluto. Now we have the potential for a clash. What is this meaning? Well, it's because the sun has moved for you into house 12, which is very much to do with tender energy. And in house 12, all this month, Jupiter and Uranus are very close together, but they come into an exact alliance on the 21st. It may be that something you're doing behind the scenes can actually bring you a result, particularly because Mars, remember I told you at the start of the month, Mars was going to be very influential for you because it was going to give you more confidence to assert yourself. Well, Mars supports that at Jupiter-Uranus conjunction on the 21st absolutely superbly. But that's in house 10, where you're most visible. The Sun... Jupiter and Uranus are now in house 12, where we do things behind the scenes. But Pluto is in the ninth house, and that's giving you a desire to get to the truth of what your world is really about. But 12th house energy uh, in a square with ninth house energy can amplify sensitivities. If there is something that's not working, at a more psychological level, or there's some people that you can't rely upon, someone who's not so uh, much of a, of a steady citizen in your world, maybe even someone who's quite critical, even if they're not critical to your face. So there can be some of these issues bubbling away, and all of that comes to the boil on the back of the full moon, which occurs on the 23rd. Now this occurs in the deep and passionate sign of Scorpio and each year when it does occur it can push some things into the open that can be a bit awkward for you because the moon's in the part of your situation to do with practicalities, to do with where you have to attend to responsibilities and obligations, the small details. But with the sun, but also Jupiter and Uranus tucked away in house 12, Jupiter potentially also a planet that can expand and exaggerate. The more psychological domain is battling with that more practical sphere, but both are T-squared by Pluto in the ninth house. Unfortunately, an uncomfortable truth may come into the open around this time. I feel on the 24th, when Mercury, your ruler, goes direct, you will feel more comfortable with the situation, but by the 29th, Venus dies into your 12th house as well. So I feel the big picture of this month, to be honest, Gemini, is that you can start it in good heart. There's the potential to really go for big goals and ambitions, particularly with Mars so strident and Venus very beautifully linked to the part of fortune. So your powers of diplomacy and, and confidence really helping you go for those ambitions, but it's all about how you connect to others. And that's the big story of this month. But the Mercury retrograde is going to tease out, despite all the wonderful connections that are made, despite the fact that Venus moves into house 11, despite the fact that there's a solar eclipse, that we then have Venus and Mercury coming together, but applying to uh, the North Node and also with Chiron. I feel 
if there is a weakness around your connections to others, it will be revealed and it's going to come into the open as this month draws to a close, particularly as Mars aligns with Neptune in the last few days. So it could be in a professional situation. It could be around your personal situation. But the best way to deal with this is really understanding what the role of Pluto is and also Chiron. Because Pluto in the sign of Aquarius through to the 2nd of September and then back again from the 18th of November is going to really open you up to lots of different ways of looking at life over the next years ahead. But particularly, it's going to, in some strange ways, bring the truth of situations into focus in a way which could be painful at times. And I think that is what can happen, particularly on that full moon towards the end of this month. But what you can do is work on keeping your clarity as sharp as you possibly can. But it's undeniable, to be honest, with Chiron so influential all through this month. I think particularly on that solar eclipse, if there is a wound around your ability or your uh, collective that you're involved in this there is something there which you find challenging or difficult you will have to stare it completely in the face by the end of this month but once you do you're reaching a point from which a new reality can emerge pluto in the ninth house and then that's going to help you enormously as you go into may because mars then bursts into your 11th house right on the first day and that's really going to take you forwards in a much more dynamic way particularly from when mercury emerges from its post retrograde shadow on the 13th of may it's been a real pleasure being with you gemini thank you so much for joining me please do check out your weekly in-depth horoscope forecast at any time but for now uh, please like comment share or subscribe so cancer on the screen now i'm showing the event chart at the start of the month we need to be mindful of your ruler that's in the sign of sagittarius and it's in the sixth house the sixth house is very much about where we should be virtuous organized and making sure that our obligations and responsibilities are met but you don't usually have an issue with that but i think you might this month and the reason is I feel that you're going to be preoccupied with the more professional and worldly interactions you have, but also by a desire to shake things up, bring a greater spirit of variety to your situation. And that's shown more than anything by the position of Mars in the ninth house, which gives you a lot of thrust, but a lot of need to be uh, much more free spirited, and much more independent in your approach. So the fact that Neptune in the same area as Mars is applying to the moon in a square suggests that those responsibilities and obligations could leave you feeling quite drained. And what you're really wanting is a gust of excitement. And if your work is particularly rather dull, repetitive, and not really giving you much personal satisfaction, the chances are you are going to want to rethink things this month. And you can also see that Jupiter and Uranus are very close together within three degrees. They become exact on the 21st, but as they do, they link to Mars. So they're in the part of your situation to do with your network. So I feel that what you're craving for at the start of this month is a change, but the change could be professionally. And I think if you are someone who is very responsible for other people, as cancer people often are, this is a month when you need to think a bit more single-mindedly about what you want from situations. And that brings us to the role of Mercury, because you can see from the event chart that Mercury is not yet retrograde, but that happens later on, on the first day of April. But Mercury will be retracing its steps through to the 23rd, and even beyond that, it's in its post-retrograde shadow and doesn't emerge from that through to the 13th of May. And Mercury being in the 10th house suggests that you may be thinking about retraining, reskilling, particularly with the retrograde. You may reconfigure your curriculum vitae. You may find yourself doing some new presentations. 
um, reaching out and forging alliances with other professionals. This could be digitally, it could be through business clubs, it could be you're going to be keen to start your own enterprise and be much more entrepreneurial. But most of all, I feel if you're experiencing a real rep repetition in your life and you don't feel heard or recognized, that's what this month is going to want to see you transform. So back to that chart, Will. You can see that the conjunction between Neptune, Venus and the part of fortune is quite mystical and, to be honest, beautiful. If you stripped out the square to uh, the moon, it would really liberate you. But even if you do try to do something different, there may be part of you that feels a bit guilty or responsible for it. So that isn't an easy aspect, that square to the moon. But Venus and Neptune do stay pretty close together through the first five days of this month. In fact, they're exact on the third, but the Sun and the North Node come into an exact conjunction on the fifth, the very day that Venus then transitions into the sign of Aries, technically debilitated in this sign. But I like Venus in Aries. It has a spark and people, if they desire something, will use the passion of the fire and the rulership of Mars of Aries to make things happen. Moreover, Venus forges an amazing link to Pluto, one that hasn't happened for over 200 years. What that's going to do, I feel, Venus climbing to the top of your chart, <clears throat> pardon me, promotes the concept of you using your diplomacy, your charm, but Pluto is in the eighth house of business. It may be that someone's impressed both by your strategic ability, Pluto, but the fact that you're relatable, they can actually have a connection with you at a more personal basis. It's not just about what you know. So it's a very, very effective alliance and really can prime you up in the most lovely of ways. But I mentioned in the introduction about the solar eclipse, this is forging an exact conjunction with Chiron, the wounded healer, by all but one minute. It's that tight. Over the next six months, if you have spent quite a lot of your life feeling that you're not really heard, not really recognized, acknowledged, that people don't really see your talents fully, you have a chance to dissolve the impact that those responses have had on your confidence and try to reset. The, the view is with Chiron, we can never heal the wound. But remember, this is a collective Chiron. Your Chiron might not be in Aries in your natal chart. So this is more about your ascendant, your sun or your moon. So what I'd say to you is it's a very good time to think about how you might be in some way sabotaging your success by not quite believing enough about how much talent you have. Now from the 10th to the 13th, the advancing Mercury meets the retreating Sun. They become exact in a conjunction on the 11th at Kazemi. This one an inferior Kazemi because of the retrograde. So Mercury sits between the Sun and Earth. But the Sun still magnifies Mercury. Mercury's retrograde is just asking you to rethink. For sure, if you apply for jobs or you're waiting for information on an interview you had or um, the person that you need to speak to in a big organization is proven elusive you may experience those things because they do happen when mercury is retrograde but mercury retrograde the whole period takes about 10 weeks we've got four lots of it this year we can't not be active through about 40 weeks of the year including the pre and post retrograde shadows so we have to be uh, very positive about what we can achieve. So I would say, think of Mercury retrograde as a chance to rethink and recalibrate your approach to your thinking and your relating Mercury in the 10th house to people in positions of influence, but also your connections through those professional organizations, whether it's through a digital app like LinkedIn, or it is through uh, some kind of local connection, the more you can put the feelers out, the better you are going to do for sure. But we are going to see a conjunction between Mercury and Chiron on the 13th. That's going to help with that rethinking. 
But then from the 14th to the 19th, a magical link between Mercury and Venus. Your ability to articulate Mercury is added to the charm and grace of Venus. That's a very compelling uh, combination. Also, Venus applies to the node on the 17th to Chiron on the 21st. Again, Venus is not just about relating. Remember, it's also about money. So good things could come if you can uh, unblock any thought that might be just lurking at the back of your subconscious that you're not quite worthy enough to achieve that success. So really important, particularly with that solar eclipse, to set your intentions and good things can come to you over the following six months. Now it is the case that from the 19th uh, through to the 25th, the sun is going to be squaring up with Pluto. First through its late degrees in the sign of Aries, then on the 19th it moves into the sign of Taurus. But remember, you have Jupiter and Uranus there in a very positive way for you. And by the 21st, they come together in that conjunction, linking with Mars, as I mentioned earlier. So if you're prepared to try something that's dramatically different, because the Sun is clashing with Pluto, it just means that if you decide to head in a new direction, there may be some financial implications, or someone close to you may in some ways try to control the change of focus that you want to apply. Just be conscious of that. We do have on the 23rd, the full moon in Scorpio, your sister water sign, and that is T squared by Pluto as well. That's asking you to think about your time management, the people you spend uh, uh, time with, to make sure that you're aligning with the right people at the right time. If you're spending too much time being a people pleaser with your friends and not expressing your individual talents, Scorpio, that needs to be rejigged. But again, because Pluto's in that eighth house, if anyone's trying to apply any possessiveness and inhibiting what you want to do because of their need for control, that's something you should try to break free of. But the 24th sees Mercury go direct, which is absolutely fantastic. And the 29th gloriously sees Venus arrive home in the sign of Taurus. Now it does square up to Pluto, it's true. And again, this issue with if someone is inhibiting what you want to do and you want to be more free spirited or reminding you, oh, well, we've got to pay the mortgage on uh, so and so, which is completely understandable. It will be important to have some deep dialogue to try to understand how you could work together to perhaps give you the space to do with what would set you free because this 11th house energy at the end of the month is really the key to that. You also have a conjunction between Mercury and Neptune in the ninth, which your desire, Mars, links to inspiration and the dream, Neptune. And if you do feel penned in, you are going to be conscious of it. So earlier on in this month, there may be some big professional decisions to make. And if one of them is to break away from a job that's been pretty steady, but is no longer fulfilling, there's going to be some very deep and serious conversations to be had about that. But by the end of the month, your connections to others, your long-term plan needs to be more in touch with your idealism rather than your pragmatism. So don't let that pragmatism pulverize what's important for you to feel uplifted. But I think some kind of shift around work, responsibilities, obligations, and you demonstrating to people your skills as a leader is a big part of the story this month for you, Cancer. It's been a real pleasure being with you. Thank you so much for joining me. Please like, comment, share or subscribe. So Leo, on the screen now, you can see the event chart right at the start of the month. The Sun, as I mentioned before, is the key player for you. And that's at 11 degrees and 45 minutes in Aries. So it's just into the second decan of Aries. And guess what? The second decan is ruled by your sun. So the sub rulership of that second 10 degree period is amplified by the energy of your ruler. So that's really exciting. But having the sun in the ninth house is going to see you thinking about shaking things up. 
showing a little bit more of a spontaneous uh, approach, being more free-spirited, wanting to travel, perhaps even in a physical sense, be a bit more rugged in your approach. But you can see the North Node, also in that second decan of Aries, very close to the Sun, and they come into an exact conjunction on the 5th. And in a very spiritual sense, this is a key moment in your whole year, because something is compelling you and attracting you towards a particular approach, and it may be more experimental than you've tried in the past, but you're set to find it truly exciting if you're really in touch with the potential fluidity. The ninth house is a very mutable kind of energy. It's not staying with what you know, it's trying out different things. But there is a bit of a catch because you can also see in your chart that we have a gathering of energy in house eight, and that's where you're most devoted, invested, and literally it can be in terms of long-term uh, finances, whether it's shares or pensions, uh, property, uh, business, all of those things are governed by the eighth house. And I just want to draw your attention to the moon because it's actually in the fifth house, very much in keeping with your sign, which is going to emphasize your warmth, affection, and your go-getting energies, but that is squaring with Neptune exactly in the eighth. If there is a business partnership or a financial situation where there's a bit more of a personal dimension attached to it and you're not quite sure, this is saying to you, make, uh, ensure that you do get a, a factual understanding of the potential of this that goes beyond the more spiritual attraction you may have. Now, it just so happens that Venus and Neptune in that eighth house are so tight together, they become exact on the 3rd of April, that actually could be beautiful for you in terms of a sexual connection. Or if you're drawing closer to someone in a spiritual way, wow, that can be such a sweet moment. But let's just also be mindful that Saturn is in your eighth house. So really important when it comes to using your resources, that you're doing so in as astute a way as possible. So the fact that the Sun, the North Node, Chiron, and even Mercury are all in the ninth house, being more adventurous, Saturn is saying you need to uh, weigh up that adventure and that open-mindedness with a very thorough, systematic approach if you are talking about shared resources. But wonderfully for you, Jupiter and Uranus, are right at the top of your chart in house 10. That's your connection to the wider world. So the drama that you're going to bring to this month through house nine, and some of the strategic wisdom through house eight, is also blessed by the conjunction between Jupiter and Uranus, which becomes exact on the 21st. That could lead to some really dazzling new opportunities unfolding for you. And ironically, Mars in the sign of Pisces is feeding into that duo sensationally as you start week three. So that can be very exciting, particularly if you are wanting to try something different and more experimental. But let's look at the role of Pluto because it's right on your seventh house cusp. So that's significant for how you relate to people. And there could be some fated connections this month for sure. So that's the big picture as you come into the month but then Mercury slams on the brakes on day one. It's gonna be in retrograde for 23 days. It starts the retrograde at 27 degrees and it inverts back to 16 degrees by the 24th. What does that mean? Well, if you are traveling anywhere, having Mercury retrograde in the ninth house points towards the potential for hassle. You know, it may be something that's beyond your control, such as air traffic controllers, industrial disputes, uh, maybe a systems failure, see software close down. But what we can do is use Mercury retrogrades to our advantage by not just thinking they only bring glitches and problems. Mercury retrogrades give us a chance to rethink, recalibrate, reset our position. The ninth house can be about knowledge. I think if you give yourself the mission to learn new knowledge this month, it can really help to expand your thinking in an extremely positive way. So 
do see it as a supreme opportunity. I mentioned to you about Venus and Neptune being in the conjunction. By the 3rd of April, it is exact, but on the 5th, that's a truly big day for this month because Venus moves into Aries, technically debilitated, but I love Venus in Aries because it has that spark. Venus is about desire, can be about money. The ninth house, remember, is more experimental, but it forges a fantastic link to Pluto. If there is someone that you're relating to, either in an emotional, sexual, or financial way, and there is a real simpatico between you, this can be a critical day because also on the 5th, the Sun forges an alliance exactly with the North Node. This hasn't happened for 18.6 years. It's a cyclical influence. Huge significance because the North Node, even if you don't have your personal North Node in Aries, collectively for uh, Leo people, has been saying since the 13th of July last year when the true node moved reverse back into Aries, look, the time for experiment experimentation is here. You need to shake things up. You need to liberate yourself from things that aren't really giving you a sense of fulfillment because you're wanting essentially in a nutshell excitement. And if you think about how long Pluto has been going through Capricorn, it may have stolen some of the excitement in your world because you became so invested in providing some kind of efficient service and maybe changing in some ways your approach to health and diet and fitness very positively, but it was all a bit virtuous and worthy. Now you need some drama back in your life. And Venus moving into this area Mercury being here as well, but the Sun's combining with the North Node is pushing you to embrace the opportunity. But that brings us to the total solar eclipse of the 8th. In the Southern Hemisphere, it is on the 9th. And it's within one minute of Chiron, the wounded healer. But in the 9th house, Chiron, and in Aries, could be to do with a wound that may be academic or if we've never traveled, or if we've always felt a bit fearful of different cultures, or in some ways uh, we didn't get the opportunities to get the education that we really would have liked when we were younger. This combination, which is going to provide a backdrop for six months, really is a huge green light to be as open-minded as possible about how you can evolve through looking at things in a new way. But one of the things that's really important is that you don't inhibit the process because you don't feel you're worthy enough to try this fresh approach. Now from the 10th to the 13th, the advancing sun meets the retreating Mercury. It's exact on the 11th, we have a Kazemi, an inferior conjunction, the sun, Mercury, Earth. So Mercury is this side of the sun. The sun glows up Mercury. For you, the ninth house, yes, there can be glitches with travel because the ninth house is very much to do with that or distribution or also anything to do with um, international affairs. So, you know, if you've got a property overseas and you're dealing with a lawyer, uh, ninth house can be to do with contracts. There could be something that has got a little, little stuck. But remember, Mercury retrogrades give us the opportunity to rethink recalibrate. The 13th sees Mercury indeed connect with Chiron. That rethinking can reduce any inner blockages you may have. The 14th to the 19th sees Mercury and Venus together in the most beautiful of ways by the 19th it's exact. If there is someone that you're connecting with it may be that you come from very different backgrounds but somehow or another there's a language that you're able to connect through. It may be a shared interest, philosophy. It could be that you fancy each other hugely, but the chances are you do switch each other's minds on. That could be something that's very attractive to you. In fact, Venus is blessing the uh, North Node on the 17th and Chiron on the 21st on its own. But then from the 19th through to the 25th, the Sun does come into a tense right angle with Pluto. 
So as much as Venus was blessed by Pluto on the 5th, as she moved into the sign of Aries, as the Sun moves into Taurus, there's Pluto lying in wait and it is a resistance because remember Pluto for you is in your sector of relating. The 10th house position of the Sun is about your need to assert your power or feel heard and recognised professionally. I think there could be a bit of a, a, a political battle in a professional situation. All this can become much more obvious to be honest on the full moon of the 23rd in the intense sign of Scorpio which for you flags up how you feel about things. The Sun and that other array of planetary influences are all in the 10th house including Jupiter and Uranus and yes you can have success but it may come at the cost of how you feel about things. So things have to feel right and especially in any kind of professional relationship, if it does not quite flow as you expect, that could be an issue for you around this time. But then Venus moves to climb to the top of your chart on the 29th. You can use your charm to try to defuse things, but it's important when Venus is in a square with Pluto, as it is, that we're not seen as being a little bit cunning or that we're actually using charm as a weapon in order to get what we want, whether it's financially or even sexually. But as the month draws to a close, Mars applies to Neptune in your eighth house. There could be some confusion through that particular influence. Maybe it is around an intimate relationship. Maybe it is around a financial package. The wonderful news to tell you is that Mars is going to be leaving the sign of Pisces as this month comes to a close. And by the time we turn the page into May, Mars is going to move into Aries, which of course it rules. And Mars, in turn, as much as the Sun rules your first 10 degrees in terms of uh, your uh, first decan, of course Mars rules your third 10 degree decan. So you have an appreciation of the energy of Mars. And Mars is going to be really supportive for you as you burst into the new month. Also remember Mercury ends the retrograde on the 24th that it's been going through. So some of the snags can start to work themselves out. It won't be until the 13th of May that it comes out of its post-retrograde shadow. But this is definitely a month of opportunity for you, Leo. I think you're in the mood to shake things up. I just feel that when the Sun does move along with Venus into Taurus and clashes with Pluto and the full moon clashes with Pluto, it's just suggesting that sometimes a change is as good as a rest, but when we actually do try something different, we may find that some of the issues that we're trying to move away from can be repeated a little bit, simply because just making that change doesn't change people. And if you're someone who needs to feel heard and someone is resisting your power, your message, your qualities, that could be the problem. But as I mentioned earlier, with Jupiter and Uranus coming together in such a spectacular way on the 21st and linking to Mars, it could be a time when you can really supercharge up your professional situation, but it needs to be in a fresh way and it needs to be where you're given the space because obviously Uranus is very much to do with freedom to try different ideas, Jupiter, philosophies, and not feel too micromanaged. So if you are going to be changing your job or your role as this month goes on because of that desire to have some fresh starts and some excitement in your life, just be aware of the politics. It's been a real pleasure being with you, Leo. Thank you so much for joining me. Please do like, comment, share or subscribe. So on the screen now, Virgo, is your event chart right at the start of the month. The critical thing to point out for you is that Mars, the planet of drive and passion, instant gratification, is parked up right on your seventh house cusp. So you can see there at seven degrees and naught minutes in the sign of Pisces, your opposite sign. That suggests you're going to set some robust, some robust boundaries this month. That's not a bad thing at all. But I want you to be mindful of the midpoint in Aquarius. 
this is the balance of the drive of the sun and the feeling of the moon so it is the overall energy of this chart and it's at 19 degrees in Aquarius in the sixth house you also have Pluto there ever since of course the 21st of January so there is a sense that things could be changing around an area that you've been quite dedicated around for quite some time it could be a practical structure in your own life it may be to do with your work but the thing is that midpoint is squaring up with Uranus which is in the part of your situation to do with freedom the overview of this is that this is a month that you could become increasingly rebellious about any kind of obligation which pens you in and stops you being a free spirit. It's all going to come up to the boil on the 21st when Uranus and Jupiter come into an exact conjunction but by then Mars has moved forwards to support them in your seventh house. So you're going to be laying down some quite strident markers this month if people are taking you for granted, I think there's a sense you're going to want to push back, even if it means some elements of your situation which have been quite settled are going to transform with that Aries energy. Now, Mercury goes retrograde, as I mentioned, later on on that first day for 23 days. It begins the retrograde at 27 degrees. By the 24th, it's inverted back to 16 degrees but it is going to be in its post-retrograde shadow through to the middle of May. So when it comes to transformations in your life, particularly around your material world, so that could be investments, property, pensions, inheritances, all those kind of areas, you may have to revisit those, do some deep dives, and really make sure that you're monitoring things with your usual precision because obviously Mercury retrograde can create some snags and catches but it can also create some opportunities this month as I will share with you shortly. But there is, you know, a magical link between Venus and Neptune at the start of this month but also the part of Fortune and that's in your seventh house. What's not to like? Well, indeed, by the 3rd of April, Venus and Neptune are exact. If there is somebody that you're drawn towards and there really is a very beautiful connection, it could be something to really behold. But you must be conscious that the Moon at the start of this month is in House 4, squaring up with Neptune and Venus. So if there is somebody that you're finding utterly fascinating, don't drop your guard too quickly because they need to prove to you that they're worthy of your affection and your loyalty. Now this doesn't mean just in a romantic context, it could be a friendship, a business proposal or a partnership or anything to do with people you're working with, you need to know where you stand. So that's very important and that's why Mars stood on that seventh house cusp really says and gives you the push not to give way too easily. But let's just look at that house eight again. So you can see the sun there and pretty close is the north node. Has been The true north node has been in your eighth house since the middle of July 2023. You may have found yourself being more attracted to some psychological uh, developments in your situation, understanding what makes you tick more at a deeper level or the actions of others. Now they're going to come together on the 5th of this month exactly. But the key with the North Node is it's quite fated. Something could unfold or develop at a very psychological level or around shared resources in a way that's very positive for you on the 5th. But equally, Venus, the planet of relating, moves out of your sector of the 7th house and into the 8th. You could be quite fortunate due to somebody else's good fortune. So whether it's a partner, whether it's a family member being very generous, whether you work in a business where they're actually very inclusive and decide that you as an employee are deserving of some extra acknowledgement or even a financial reward. I know that that has not really been the narrative recently because of the financial crunch, but you could have some good financial news around the fifth. 
Not least that Venus forges a link to Pluto for the first time in over 200 years with Pluto in Aquarius. So Venus in the 8th house, to be honest, can also be very sultry. If there is somebody that has been tantalisingly of interest to you and they do pass those initial tests that you feel that they are clear in their intention and you know where you stand, the next weeks ahead could see you really sparking at a very sensual level with one another. So really exciting stuff. But by the total solar eclipse of the 8th in the north, the 9th in the summer, southern hemisphere, that's very close, almost only one minute away from Chiron. Chiron has, I feel, a little bit of an unfair reputation. Chiron is often where we will shine, but it's often where we feel we get the least back from others. Now, it depends on where your natal Chiron is and in what house it's in, but in terms of the collective, in this sense, it's in house eight. So if you're someone who's very astute with managing your resources and you're very invested in your job or your partnership or your friendships, but you feel other people are not so good, that could be something that you're going to want to grapple with over the following six months, which is the length of impact of this particular eclipse. But from the 10th to the 13th, your ruler Mercury in its retrograde meets the advancing sun on the 11th in a Kazemi. This is an inferior conjunction because of the retrograde, Mercury is this side of the sun, from the sun, Mercury, the position of Earth. So if you are a little bit unsure, and you're needing to get um, more informed, see the Mercury retrograde as an opportunity to find out a lot more information. It could be about pensions, it may be about savings, it's possibly about anything to do with uh, business or property matters, but your natural penchant for diving deep and really grappling in a very uh, precise way with the minutiae is really going to be to your advantage. Now of course we know that Mercury retrogrades can create snags so somebody else may be slow in providing information to you or if you're waiting for a refund or a payout that may not come through quite as quickly as you would like but be assured from the 14th through to the 19th Mercury and Venus come together in a conjunction, which is exact on the 19th, and that could provide the outcome in a more positive way. Also, there's a lovely link between Mercury and Chiron on the 13th. If there is something you need to discuss, for example, if you wanted to have some counselling, or you wanted to advise somebody that you're very fond of, uh, that is a prime moment to embrace that process. Also, Venus applies to the node on the 17th, Chiron on the 21st. Again, in very positive ways, if you're wanting to dive deep. The 8th house energy is not superficial. It can be where things will end, and it can be where things will be reborn. So, if something does fade out for you during this series of days or during this solar eclipse in the next six months. Although it may prove to be somewhat painful, perhaps even, if I'm really honest, traumatic, it is going to clear the way for you to be much more liberated because remember, you've had Venus um, moving through your eighth house, uh, the planet of relating the money from the fifth, but actually in terms of Uranus and Jupiter in your ninth house, they've really been pushing you in recent times to be more experimental. And there's part of your condition that may find that rather difficult because giving a service, being supportive, having some firm structures in your life give you a sense of stability. But sometimes I feel that that is freezing and almost paralyzing your uh, passion and the eighth house is about passion so in some ways if you do go through some delicate situations this month or uh, things are not necessarily panning out exactly as you want just be aware that the big picture is that at some level 
you are deciding to change things. And I think that that Uranus square, the midpoint at the start of the month, and Mars being on your seventh house, means that you're developing a more rebellious streak, even if it means in some ways rocking what's provided some stability for some time. All of this will start to make a lot more sense when the Sun moves into your sister Earth sign of Taurus, Jupiter and Uranus on the 19th. Now for you, that ninth house energy gives you the desire to free yourself even more if things have been cloying or someone's been very possessive or making demands or there's been heavy jealousy around any kind of involvement. The sun moving to join up with those two and those two come in into that conjunction on the 21st, Jupiter and Uranus, but also in that sextile to the passionate Mars, you're really going to feel uh, much more motivated by this part of the month. But there is a potential snag and it lays in the guise of Pluto because Pluto's in house six as I said to you at the start of the presentation and that's very much to do with the pattern in your life. Pluto's about change. Pluto interfaces with this particular uh, sun ingress in a tense right angle. It's important if you are going to try to break something down and take a more escapist approach that you're just aware that it could be bumpy. And that may become more obvious to you on the 23rd when we have the full moon in the passionate sign of Scorpio. For you that's about your everyday thinking and communication. The ninth house position of the sun is your higher ideal, the truth of situations, but that's t in that event, that uh, lunation is t in Pluto too. So your ideas may create some friction. So this need to articulate yourself, find your voice, be more rebellious, may create some inner tension because there's a change, or someone may feel threatened because you're wanting to shake things up somewhat. The good news is that with Mercury going direct on the 24th, that will help to quell some of the tension. But on the 29th, it's Venus's turn to square up with Pluto. But for you, it's a great news story because Venus joins up with the Sun, Jupiter and Uranus in your ninth house. And also Mars applies to Neptune at the end of this month. It can bring a little bit more of an idealistic vibe to your relationship situation. But if you have been going through quite a bumpy ride in terms of an involvement where there is a lot of politics, you do feel penned in and you feel you have no choice but to break out and escape, whether it's a job that you're not feeling appreciated in, whether it's a friendship where someone is a bit clingy and controlling, or it is that personal relationship, by the end of this month, your desire to be much more go-getting and independent, freedom-loving, and most of all, if you can, uh, do some travel, break out, do something that's much more spontaneous as this month draws to a close. It will be like a breath of fresh air. So as this month begins, Virgo, there's a lot of emphasis on your relating sector, but some big transformations are possible at the heart of the month. By the end of the month, you'll know whether you need to stay and continue to work at a close involvement or some uh, situation where you're really deeply invested or you need to accept that there does need to be some change and going through the change may upset some of the um, set routines and uh, more modulated approaches that you've had for some time. You can resist it at this first blush, it's true, but Pluto's going to be pushing you more and more over the years ahead to shake things up so that the giving you do to support others, the appreciation you have of providing services, is in a way which doesn't kill your personal expression and your passion. It's been a real pleasure being with you. Please do like, comment, share or subscribe. So Libra, on the screen now is the event chart for April for you. And you can see the midpoint is in the sign of Aquarius, your sister air sign, but in the fifth house. A fifth house can be fun, sociable, uh, certainly where we can showcase our talent. The midpoint's the balance of the thrust of the sun, which begins this month in your seventh house in Aries, and the receptiveness of the moon in your third house, Chatty, in the free-spirited Sagittarius. But the balance of those two energies unified is 
Aquarius. So this month, having some fun, being playful, the fifth house, but also developing your individual talents is going to be important. What's not to like? But let's look at the position of Uranus in house eight. House eight is where we're most devoted. And it's where the sun's going to move and your ruler Venus later in April. Also got Jupiter there as well. Now you may be aware that these two are going to come into an exact conjunction on the 21st of April, which is a once in a 14 year event, but they're actually very close together already within three degrees. But the eighth house for you could be where there's going to be transformations. But Uranus doesn't like being in Taurus and although it does exalt in the sign of Scorpio, I think for you, this position of Uranus squaring up with the midpoint in Aquarius points towards if there is a romantic situation that you're involved with at the start of this month or you encounter someone this month and you feel that you're having to give away your individuality too much, it may be something that you're going to push back against. And that collective in the seventh house is reminding you it's not just about your skill as a relator, a listener, and bending into other people's needs because you're a past, you know, that's part of what makes you very special indeed. But also it's important with the seventh house to set a boundary. And I think that square between the midpoint and Uranus is saying, if you feel compromised in terms of who you want to be, you will need to set a boundary. Now you can see there's a whole load of energy, including your ruler in house six. That's much more to do with the pragmatic details of life, our structures, where we need to be disciplined, also where we need to show some sacrifices. Now you have Saturn in that area, which suggests your physical vitality does need to be measured out a little bit. You won't have oodles of it, I don't feel. And also your rule of Venus, although it's in a beautiful conjunction with the part of fortune, which could be lucky if you're applying for jobs, it is also conjunct Neptune, which is very idealistic. If you're wanting, if you, you meet somebody new, if you're wanting someone to tune in to a higher kind of spiritual level, it may be that you just need to be a little bit patient to see if that person can live up to your high expectation. But just look at that position of the moon because it does square up with Neptune. So if you try to be too productive, the sixth house, which is where Mars and Saturn are, and push to get every part of your life working in a metronomically organized way, what can happen is you will drain your vitality because uh, the moon square Neptune is a very sensitive influence. It also suggests that when it comes to conversations at work, you can actually pick up people's energy in a non-verbal way, which won't necessarily be good for you. Which is why, with your ruler Venus moving into your seventh house on the fifth, but forging an amazing link to Pluto, the first for over 200 years, that's a unique moment in your whole a developing situation to set your boundaries but in a way that you can still retain that gracefulness and that charm which is very much part of you. Also there's a connection between the Sun and Chiron on the 5th and that's very potentially karmic. If you are wanting to meet somebody and you met them around the 5th, oh my word it would just be so important. I couldn't absolutely guarantee you that this would be a life partner, but what I could say to you is that this person will have a profound impact on you and you on they. So the fifth is a critical moment in this month, despite the fact that Mercury does go into the retrograde on the first in your sector of relating. But think of it like this, Mercury retrogrades have a popular message that everything gets jammed up, fails, causes glitches, you know, our devices pack in, the trusted domestic appliances fail, uh, our ticket arrangements for, for travel get cancelled at the last minute, and all of that, as you know, is entirely possible. But the seventh house energy of Mercury could be pushing you to rethink how you listen, how you connect to others, there's a lot to be gained 
by actually finding a delicate balance between what you need and what others want. But that doesn't mean to say that you have to give away your power completely. Now, people who have the moon or Venus in their seventh house can sometimes find it difficult to feel heard and can sense a, a lack of being valued by the other person or other people because they're so attuned, so skilled at getting along with other people. The seventh house is completely the opposite to the first house, which is about our identity. So I feel at the start of this month, you may need to rethink a few things in terms of your approach. Are you perhaps in a little bit of a rut around an existing relationship? Is there a way that you could reinvigorate it in some way? And with the solar eclipse happening on the 8th in the north, 9th in the south, and within one minute of Chiron, this would be a marvellous moment to try to put some healing into all sorts of relationships. So things have bumped along the bottom. You have really gone through it with Pluto going through the sign of Capricorn. But also since Neptune and then in the last year, uh, Saturn have gone through your sixth house. It's been so much give for Libra and people and really not feeling that other people, particularly family members, or in a more emotional context, other people have been so conscious of where you've been. And at times that's been profoundly disappointing. Also, Libra and people can feel if they're not in a relationship or not heard, almost lost. So this is a month when you could try to dissolve that feeling that you have to be in a relationship. You can decide to re-engineer an existing relationship or the relationship with yourself about relationships, whether you're in one or not, because that's the value of that particular set of energies. Mercury retrograde, Venus into the seventh, sextile in Pluto, and the Sun applying to the North Node. For the first time in 18.6 years, in this way, at this degree. And then we also have, from the 10th to the 13th, the retreat in Mercury meets the advance in Sun. There's a Kazemi, an inferior conjunction on the 11th. That's because of the retrograde, we have the Sun, Mercury, Earth. But still the Sun amplifies the energy of Mercury. If something has been lost in translation, this Mercury retrograde could give you the opportunity to revisit it and resolve it. Also, Mercury applies to Chiron on the 13th. From the 14th to the 19th, and exactly on the 19th, Mercury and Venus come together in a beautiful alliance. So despite Mercury's retrograde, so many opportunities. Also, your ruler applies to the node, 17th, Chiron, 21st. So many opportunities to reset relationships on a better footing or bring someone new into your world in a quite stunning way. Now, from the 19th to the 25th, the sun does start to forge a tense right angle to Pluto. On the 19th itself, the sun travels into the sign of Taurus, which for you is the eighth house. However much discussion and dialogue there's been with all that seventh house energy, the sun moving to join up with Jupiter and Uranus on the 19th in your eighth house is really going to ask the brutal question, what is the true meaning? Because we can have charming chat, but it's what people, what the subtext means. Don your detective Mac at this part of the month. It's going to help you to decode what comes up. The passionate full moon of the 23rd is in Scorpio, the most intense full moon of the whole year. Now for you, it's possible that you may have to discuss finances, particularly as this full moon T-squares with Pluto. If your approach to resources is different from someone you're closely connected to, it could be a family member, it could be an offspring, could be a business partner or a romantic partner, there can be a tussle right at the end of this month. Fortunately, on the 24th, Mercury goes direct, but we're not completely out of the proverbial long grass because Mercury doesn't emerge from its post-retrograde shadow until the 13th of May. But the other piece of news is Venus, your ruler, joins up with uh, the Sun uh, Jupiter and also Uranus on the 29th. But of course, on the 21st, we have 
that Jupiter and Uranus become exact, but they are supported by that point, by the hustle bustle energy of Mars. If there is something that you want to be very dynamic about in terms of investment, entrepreneurial plans, uh, business, marshalling your long-term resources in a more imaginative and fresh way, Uranus, with a spirit of hope, Jupiter, the drive of Mars, and then Venus comes in to support all of them and also the Sun on the 29th. But Venus is mangled by Pluto too. So even if you've been getting on well with someone romantically earlier in the month, there could be some deep politics that come up by the 29th if you feel that the attraction to you or they feel the attraction from you to them is based on sex only or a financial motive only. Because when Venus and Pluto square, that is the question that we need to ask ourselves. What is our motive? And also, what is the motive of the other person? Also, Mars is applying to Neptune in the last few days of this month because it's going to be moving into your seventh house as we go into the start of May. So that change with Mars as this month ends is going to give you a heck of a lot of feistiness if you feel someone has been mucking around, not playing fair, not listening, not collaborating and cooperating in the way that you may be very keen to do for much of this month. But there is some real challenges as we get into that last phase of the month, really about how meaningful, how sincere, how devotional the other side is, or how you, how devotional you feel you are, and if there is any tests around that which don't feel right and cramp your ability to be a free spirit, which is Pluto and the midpoint in Aquarius, by the end of the month, you may decide to break free. So it's a fascinating month, Libra. I can't stress enough how that midpoint in Aquarius, squaring up with Uranus, is a big part of the story because superficially it looks like there's huge opportunities to relate well this month, and there certainly are. And remember, the solar eclipse provides a backdrop energy for the next six months. So if you've got any self-limiting thoughts or attitudes around your worth as a person to be in a relationship, or you think, I'm not going there, they've just caused me problems, I need to stay safe, totally understandable, but Chiron's asking you to rethink all of that. So it's a very intense month, but with huge opportunities, but both at the start of the month and the end of the month, you're going to find out whether something is really worth how much you want to put into it and how much someone wants to put into it with you. It's been a real pleasure being with you. Please like, comment, share or subscribe. Scorpio on the screen now, you can see your event chart. And there is Uranus and Jupiter that I was just telling you about in your sector of relating house seven. Really exciting. But look at the symbol of the moon and the sun. That's the midpoint. If we think about where the moon is in Sagittarius in your second house and where the position of the sun is in the sixth house and then we add them together, we get the exact midpoint between them. And for you, that's in house four. So that's how you feel about things. But it can also be about family matters, where you live, how you live there. But key, you've got the trans positional and transformational energy of your modern ruler Pluto right on your fourth house cusp. So having that and the midpoint in Aquarius in your fourth house suggests that your emotional world is going to be part of the story this month, but also Uranus is in a clash with that midpoint. So how you feel about things may not mesh quite as sweetly as you would like with how you relate to others, certainly not towards the beginning of the month. But having said that, you can see there's a big collective of energy in the sign of Aries, which is about those practicalities. The Sun, the Node, Chiron, and also Mercury. Now Mercury goes into a retrograde on the first day of this month. It's not there as we begin the month. It happens later that day and goes on for 23 days. Some kind of rethinking or rescheduling or resetting around how you think Mercury or discuss Mercury, your obligations, sixth house, also your work, uh, where you need to support others, where you need to be dedicated, precise, very sixth house, 
look at the details, but there could be some kind of shifts. New information could come in, inform your approach to diet particularly, but also health and fitness as well. But if you're not feeling very fulfilled in a job and it feels a bit dull, this could be a big month of transformation for you. So we need to be conscious of Mercury. But look at that energy in House 5. House 5 includes your ruler, your traditional ruler of Mars. And Mars is going to forge a very influential link to Jupiter and Uranus by the 21st in a very supportive way. But you can also see that we've got the more restrictive and more um, slowing energy of Saturn in the fifth house. So there could be a little bit of frustration, they're pretty close, about six and a half degrees. But the other thing to point out is that Venus in the fifth house can be very romantic and that's very close to Neptune. In fact, the part of fortune is parked up next to Venus. If there is someone who's really made it, making your heart sing and you're feeling really loved up, that seems a magical alliance. It's just that if we look at the position of the moon, that squares up with Neptune, second five. If there is someone you really like, there could be a tendency to try to spoil them. Grand gestures, really, really uh, pour in your warmth, affection, fifth house, and generosity, second house, into priming up the relationship. That could be an error. Much better to see how things evolve, to be honest. And that energy in Aries is asking you actually to keep it quite grounded because it's obviously six house energy is very earthy. So as much as there seems to be a very flirty, playful and romantic vibe, we can't forget that Saturn's there and nor can we forget that the midpoint's in the fourth house of feelings in a very stormy right angle with Uranus. Maybe it, the case is that you're attracted to someone that people in your family don't like. Maybe you've been in a relationship or even in one now, but there's someone else showing an interest, but it could mean upsetting the proverbial celestial apple cart in order to embrace that person and that opportunity. So interesting stuff as we go into the month, but by the third, there's a magical link between Venus and Neptune. It becomes exact. If someone's a true heart and your intentions are true as well, this can be one of the most beautiful alliances possible in astrology, but it also can be one of the biggest uh, deceptive influences if someone isn't sincere. So just be aware of that. So having that sixth house energy can help you to just analyse things a little bit. Just be a little bit more sceptical. Now the sun moves on from the start of the month to align with the retreating North Node exactly on the 5th. This is a very, very uh, beautiful alliance. Now, it's possible that your North Node isn't in Aries in your natal chart, and it isn't, therefore, in your 6th solar house or 6th natal house. But what we can do is look at this event in a collective sense as a Scorpio. So... Maybe you're being called in a particular direction in terms of your work, your sacrifices, your obligations, where you're very responsible, the sixth house. And maybe it's requiring a shift from where you are now. Listen to your sixth sense because the North Node is very much about an imperceptible pull towards some new objective. So if you find yourself being pulled towards a new approach, a fresh way of eating or exercising, do be very open to it. But on the fifth too, Venus, the planet of love and affection, moves out of the glam fifth house and into the crunchingly responsible six. Venus in Virgo is known as being in its fall. So you could argue it's not very sexy. In a technical sense, Venus in Aries is also detrimented. Don't take any notice at all. I really think this is one of those essential dignities that we should really challenge. Venus in Aries gives people gumption and a bit of desire to use the fire of Aries to get what they want. Why not? But it also forges a very deep link to Pluto, your modern ruler, the first time for over 200 years. So Pluto, newly in that sector of emotion, feeling, maybe pushing you to transform part of your physical structures or your inner emotional world. And that could be true of relationships. 
is it saying to you, this alliance, that maybe you need to be a little bit more sacrificing? Not always just be so focused on the more romantic dimension or what you want. How can you do things for the other person? Even making them a lovely cup of tea in bed, it may not sound hugely romantic, but that kind of sacrifice can actually draw people very close together. So that could be a very special moment. But then we have the total solar eclipse, as it will be in the States, on the 8th. In the Southern Hemisphere, it's on the 9th, in the sign of Aries, providing a backdrop of energy for the next six months. But it does connect by just one minute out with Chiron. Chiron in the 6th house. Chiron in the 6th house, if someone had that natally, they're probably brilliant at coaching people on what to eat and drink. Oh, you need to try this supplement. Absolutely fantastic. Oh, this particular uh, mineral or um, this thing will help you sleep better or give you more energy. They really have a gift for that. Or they could be someone who work in food distribution and or run a supermarket. Or they could be someone who may be a, a, a coach when it comes to physical exercise, uh, a fitness trainer. Um, but what about what they get back? And that's the nub or key with Chiron, because that's the glyph for Chiron. What's the key? So what knowledge can you gain over the next six months about refining in perhaps step-by-step uh, -step ways, marginal gains, little bits and details about your life structure? And it could be that if you feel unfulfilled that other people are not very acknowledging about your sacrifice, how hard you work, how dedicated you are, you need to work on feeding that sense of worth into yourself. So that can be a critical point for us all. From the 10th to the 13th, the uh, retreat in Mercury meets the advancing sun. It's exact on the 11th. It's a Kazemi. It's an inferior conjunction because Mercury is this side of the sun due to its retrograde. But we can still gain a lot. Again, you can grapple with the details. Mercury retrogrades can cause glitches. We know that. And if you do have an appointment, uh, just a standard routine, regular appointment to have your blood done or your blood pressure checked or it's to do with your pet, their annual inoculation, all very six house stuff. Yes, Mercury could cause some mischief. But also it can provide so many opportunities to rethink or discuss anything to do with your work, your responsibilities, your obligations. Also, we're going to have a phenomenal link between Mercury and Chiron on the 13th. From the 14th to the 19th, Mercury and Venus meet together, exact on the 19th. That's one of the most lovely aspects in astrology. Okay, again in the 6th, might not seem very sexy, but you can have a discussion, perhaps an interview across those days, and be offered a new job. Also, Venus applies to the node on the 17th, to Chiron on the 21st. Perhaps forgiving ourselves a little bit about something that's not quite perfect in our life may be important. But then the Sun starts to apply in a right angle to Pluto. It did this last year, um, but this is going to be felt a little bit more keenly, I feel, because hot on the heels of the Sun moving into the sign of Taurus, your seventh house, we're going to have Venus also clashing with Pluto, and we have the full Moon in your sign on the 23rd, also being T-squared by Pluto. So let's unpack all of this. The Sun moving into your seventh house gives you an opportunity to think about relationships, but I think the seventh house, traditional astrology says it's the sector of open enemies, so that's the people we know aren't for us, but we know we have to engage with them. Could be colleagues that we find grumpy, a boss who's too demanding, but we still have to collaborate. Or it may be that we enjoy sport, particularly if you're someone who likes um, sort of one-to-one -one sports like badminton, squash, tennis, because it's com com combative. And the seventh house can be about where we set our boundaries. It's not all about just relating, because that in a way is a one-sided view of it. Because what about the other person's needs to relate? So if we set our boundaries and we're clear about what we want to give, what we expect to give, give 
but also what we expect to get, then we can have more honest relationships and contacts with others. So I feel that the Sun moving but clashing with Pluto could bring up any politics around an existing relationship or make you much more aware of someone you're interested in. Does it feel right? If it doesn't feel right, let's go back to that midpoint at the start of the month. It was in your fourth house of feeling and it clashed with Uranus. Don't compromise your ind individuality for the wrong relationship. But then on the 21st, Jupiter and Uranus come together for the first time in 14 years, supported by your ruler, traditional ruler Mars, in a great part of your scope, the fifth house. So it's shrugged off the more limiting energies of Saturn. And if there is someone that you really have a mesmeric connection with, because Uranus can see things happen very quickly and there could be a spark, which really is very exciting, but the sun's still so close to the right angle with Pluto, then the full moon of the 23rd in your sign. And it's all about relationships. So if you felt unheard, unrespected, that someone wasn't meeting your needs in terms of your boundaries, you may actually want to bail out, which takes us back to that midpoint, squaring up to Uranus at the start of the month. Now, Mercury goes direct on the 24th, which is welcome. If there have been or has been a sense of brittleness or inflexibility or tension, that can ease a bit, but it doesn't come out of the post-retrograde shadow until the 13th of May. Just be aware of that. But on the 29th, Venus moves into its home sign of Taurus, which on the face of it is delicious. We've got the combination of the 7th house energy, very Libra and about relating, but also an appreciation of the good things. If you did go on a date, go out and eat for sure, eat and drink, it would be delightful. But again, if you feel pulled towards somebody because of what they may do for a living or because you know they're quite well off or because you feel that there's some kind of benefit that goes beyond just the idealism of a lovely relationship. Just check your motives. But if your motives are squeaky clean, what about the other person? So we need to be very honest about relationships, I feel, at the end of this month. So as much as that uh, Jupiter-Uranus uh, aspect will be flagged up all over YouTube as being incredible, we've got to look at the big picture and for sure, your traditional ruler Mars does support it brilliantly, but there's other complex energies going on. And really, it all goes back to how you feel, because that's where Pluto is. That's where the midpoint is at the start of the month. It does start, the month does start with the potential for a magical connection. It does get much more to do with practicalities, routines, work, responsibilities and obligations. There could be some snags, some tensions, but also some opportunities, then the focus is very much on relationships as this month comes to a close. If you're in a relationship where you both are totally all in, but very good at listening to where each of you are coming from, this could be a, a superb end to the month as Mars, your traditional ruler, applies to Neptune in the fifth house. If not, you may end the month feeling a bit dispirited and unsure about where you really stand. But as you go into May, your traditional ruler Mars bursts into Aries, which it rules, but that's the sixth house. And it really is gonna give you a much uh, greater energy and vitality to deal with any facet of your life. And it's going to be there uh, for six weeks and give you a great opportunity just to uh, really maneuver and, and negotiate uh, all the different elements of your situation. So this month, without doubt, could start quite magically. It does require you to be realistic, but also understand the psychology around your relationships as it comes to a close. It's been a real pleasure being with you, Scorpio. Be honoured if you would like, comment, share or subscribe. So Sagittarius, on the screen now, there is the event chart. So I mentioned about Uranus and Jupiter. And there they are in house six, and they come together in an exact union on the 21st. But as we start this month, the position of Uranus is actually in a tense right angle to the position of the midpoint. 
The midpoint resides in the sign of Aquarius. What is it? If you look at the position of the moon at 2745 in Sagittarius, your sign, house one, and the position of the sun in the glorious fifth house for you at 1145, if we add them together, we get the balance of the drive and the passion of the sun, the receptiveness and need for security of the moon. And it's in the third house, quick communication, along with Pluto, and the host is the unique energies of Aquarius. So your desire to find your voice, the third house, and articulate quickly, comes into a conflict with the tension that can be created with Uranus in the six. So all through this month, I do feel that you could find it difficult still to turn off. Uh, and you could feel that things are quite intense. The best way to deal with that aspect is to exercise as much as you possibly can. But also the moon in your sign at 2745, if you look at the position of, of, uh, of uh, Neptune, that's at 2754. So they're almost in an exact right angle or 90 degrees square. The thing is with the moon and Neptune in the square, it's rather like the moon card in tarot. It can create a degree of confusion and, and uncertainty because the moon is in the first house, wants you to be invested in what you need as an individual, but also your responses can feel very immediate. Whereas having Neptune in the fourth house could lead to some uncertainty or even confusion about home and emotional matters. But you know, it doesn't have to be like that because there's a glorious alliance between the part of fortune, Venus and Neptune in your fourth house. If you're making some changes to where you live, especially decorative ones, or you're working on a business or a hobby craft that's very imaginative and creative in the comfort of your home, that set of influences is very good. It's just, of course, that Saturn's in your fourth house. Neptune, of course, can drain. Saturn can obstruct and limit. So your home situation may be quite magical in some ways, but not quite as you want in others, just being really honest. So that could feed into your nervous system, the third house. Third house governs our nerves and also our senses, our eyes, our speaking and our hearing. And therefore, I feel that you're going to be very sensitive to your environment and that could put you a little bit on edge. But that's just part of the big picture because let's look at house five because that really provides so much opportunity for you this month. The sun in your sister fire sign of Aries, very close to the north node, Chiron, and also Mercury. Now I like Mercury in the sign of Aries because it has a passionate, fast moving vibe to it, but it does go retrograde later on, on the first day. So through the first 23 days of this month, emerging on the 24th, Mercury retrograde in your fifth house. The fifth house is to do with dates, socializing, where we want to frame our talents, where we want to be particularly self-expressive. But the sun meets up with Chiron in an exact conjunction on the 5th. And that's also a very critical day because Venus and Neptune meet exactly on the 3rd, but then Venus moves on into the sign of Aquarius by the 5th, the same day that the Sun meets up with the North Node. The retreating North Node meets the advancing Sun, and then we've got the advancing Venus meets up with the sign of Aries and then forges a beautiful sextile to Pluto. Like that midpoint in your third house of how you think, your expression of your ideas. If there is somebody that you're really, really attracted to, or there's an idea where you can showcase your creative talents, because Venus is rulership of Taurus, can be very much to do with the arts. It's rulership of the sign of Libra, very much to do with presentation. But the fifth house can be where you can feel gorgeous, or should I say, even more gorgeous. But the link with Pluto can help you to feel in a very powerful way the power of your connections to anyone else who's important in your life. If you have some conversations around this time, particularly with the Sun applying to the North Node, 
If you are able to really express yourself to the maximum in a way that feels safe, comfortable, and totally free, which is part of your DNA, you're really going to get a lot from it. But what about that Mercury retrograde in the same area? Well, Mercury retrograde in the fifth house suggests to me that, yeah, you could uh, try to connect with someone this month. It might get changed at the last minute. That could be hugely frustrating. But what Venus and the North Node and the Sun, all in the fifth house, particularly Venus is linked to Pluto, are saying is have a belief in how things evolve for you in a more spiritual and karmic way. Because the North Node sometimes is where we're drawn towards without really being consciously sure of why it is. I feel there is a collective thing. It can be about colour schemes, it can be about architectural design, it can be about music, it can be about even the colours of fashion trends. I feel that that often is collective and the North Node can drive that. Now the sign of Aries is of course fire and it's really pushing you to spark up that element within your nature because ever since Neptune moved into your fourth house in 2012, joined by Saturn just over a year ago on March the 7th, 223, I feel that your flame has been diminuted somewhat. And of course there was that long journey of Pluto through Capricorn and previous to that going across your sun and perhaps other personal planets. So it's been a very intense period of time, perhaps since you were born, if you're younger, if you're older, certainly an extremely powerful period of time. So what you've got with this energy, despite Mercury's retrograde, is a chance to evoke the concept of fire, and fire is passion. And because we have the solar eclipse, the total solar eclipse in the States in certain areas on the 8th, it's in the ninth in the southern hemisphere, but within one minute of Chiron, the wounded healer, if you feel in some way a wound about your sense of attractiveness, your sense of glam, your sense of talent and creativity, uh, your relationship to the idea of having children, if you feel there is a pain around love and intimacy, this is your chance to reinvigorate yourself in such a significant way in the following six months, because that is the length of influence of that eclipse. But there's more, you know, because from the 10th to the 13th, the retreat in Mercury meets the advancing sun. We have a Kazemi, an exact conjunction on the 11th. So the sun still amplifies the energy of Mercury, despite its retrograde, but could be asking you to rethink something or take a new approach to your talents, and that may mean flexing in some way, but also addressing any lack of confidence that Saturn, and before it Neptune, and still with Neptune, may be impacting on your thinking. Now, on the 13th, Mercury applies to Chiron, a great opportunity to rethink any hurts that may be inhibiting you. But the 19th sees uh, Mercury and Venus come together in, a, in an exact conjunction, but actually they start to connect from the 14th. That's a really flirty, a beautiful link. You know, if you did want to meet up with someone, if you're guided by Mercury retrograde, you'll think, I'm not doing it, it's Mercury retrograde. But Mercury retrograde, the pre and post shadow periods, and the times we have them each year, and we're having two this year in Sagittarius, can come in total to near to 10 weeks. So why would we be denying the opportunity to connect with people or to have discussions or to travel for over 35, 40 weeks? It just doesn't make sense. So we have to work with Mercury retrogrades and what they're telling us is to rethink because they're about thinking, re-speak, re-communicate, find our voices in a fresh way which amplifies the benefit. So there's huge opportunities. Also Venus applies to the node 17th, Chiron the 21st, in a magical way as well. So you could meet someone this month and it could be superb, or your social life can just really be back on form and you can be out, playful, uh, dazzling people with your sense of humour, the warmth of your personality. Because I feel that Saturn has 
knocked a little bit of wind out of your celestial sails over the last year. But that brings us to the 19th. The Sun plays catch up with Jupiter and Uranus, but it also clashes with Pluto. Because the Sun moving into the sixth house is about practicalities, the third house is about how we think, that energy, and remember you have it at the start of the month between the midpoint and Uranus, third, sixth, can create tension, particularly if we try to be too virtuous. But one of the things that the combination on the 21st of Jupiter and Uranus and the sextile to Mars and the Sun can do is ask you to think afresh. And your sign, along with Uranus, is gifted by the fact that you're often very forward-thinking, very open-minded. You're not so welded in how it was because you're a very progressive sign. So if you do need to take a fresh approach to diet, sixth house, life structure, sixth house, obligation, sixth house, work, sixth house, um, nutrition, sixth house, um, and just your overall organisation. Do you need to declutter, get things cleared up, create more space, which you always have a huge appreciation for? Seize the opportunity, even if it does mean you have to push yourself. The key is don't try to do too much because you could really put yourself into a bit of a frazzle. Now the 23rd is a tricky full moon to be honest, the trickiest of the whole year for you because it's in house 12. It's also in the passionate psychological uh, Scorpio, opposing the sun in the practical six, T squared by Pluto in the third. Something may come up in the following two weeks which you don't appreciate. It may be something to do with your work to be honest. I wouldn't be too trusting um, about people that you have to connect and collaborate with. It doesn't mean to say that they're absolutely out to do you down, but it just could be plain old office politics. So keep your guard. There may be someone who's a bit of a schemer, but it's all about power. What they may resist from you is actually you have a strong sense of your values. And because Pluto in the third house is giving you more encouragement to express them, so just be aware that someone could feel a bit challenged by your conviction, but you know you should be proud of that. And then on the 24th, Mercury goes direct, and that's a good news story. It doesn't come out as a shadow until the 13th of May, but it is going to free you up. Things will flow much easier. But the 29th sees Venus join up with the Sun, Jupiter and Uranus in House 6. Venus loves being in Taurus. It could trigger a job offer. Maybe if you're someone who really appreciates home cooking, making your own bread, growing your own vegetables, uh, using organics, um, just really getting earthy can be a real good thing to do. If you enjoy pottering or crafting, they can be really emphasized. But in a relationship and financial sense, Venus clashes with Pluto. There may be a situation where there's some politics, even if you don't want there to be politics. Perhaps you feel obliged in some way to do something in order to keep the status quo intact. As the month draws to a close, Mars applies to Neptune in your fourth house. Maybe something you feel very strongly about can suddenly feel very overpowering and you could feel somewhat drained. Just be aware, as the month comes to a close, Mars moves into the sign of Aries, which it governs. That's superb for you. You're going to absolutely burst into the month of May. I absolutely promise you, in really feisty form. But you can see this month does have the potential for tension. There is the push to make some fundamental changes to the practical part of your world, the sixth house. But there's also an oodles of potential to be more playful, sociable, romantic, but it may require some rethinking, but also working on any inner blockages you have in terms of your self-worth around affection, warmth, children, um, and expressing your flair, artistry, and talents in any way at all. That is the story of this month. I wish you all the best with it, Sagittarius. Please like, comment, share, or subscribe. So Capricorn, as you start this month, I'm sharing on the screen now the event chart for your sign. And you can see at 0 degrees in your sign, 
Uh, we also have just tucked inside of that the moon in the 12th house in the free-spirited Sagittarius. But the moon in the 12th house can be very much to do with feeling a need to withdraw a little bit. It certainly could see you quite sensitive at the very start of this month. But if we look at the position of Neptune, just down there almost on the 4th house cusp, very much to do with how you feel, the Moon and Neptune are in a square. Whatever you discuss this month, whatever you think about, the ideas you exchange, the uh, programmes or TV shows that you tune into, the information that you download, is going to have quite an effect upon you. But it can have an effect in a very psychological way. And that's the key aspect that takes you into this new month. But also you can see the midpoint in the sign of Aquarius is in the second house. The midpoint's the balance between the desire of the sun, which of course is very much about our inner energy, and the moon, which is very much about protectiveness. The balance of those two, and divided by two with the midpoint is in Aquarius and that's in the second house but that's squaring up to Uranus in house five. You could find yourself a little bit impetuous this month in terms of splashing out on things that might give you a sense of uplift but understanding the motive behind that is going to be important too. But there is a big cluster of energy in the sign of Pisces beyond Neptune and you can see that Venus is pretty close to Neptune, uh, but right by uh, Venus is the part of fortune. If you have conversations with people who are sincere, could be a neighbour, could be a sibling, or you're sharing ideas that are inspirational, they could definitely uh, create a lot of interest from others. But broadly, the Moon is squaring up with both the part of fortune and Venus too. So. That unreality that the moon square with Neptune can create is something to be mindful of. How do you overcome that? Well, I think it's important to listen to your instincts if you do feel something doesn't seem quite right at a gut level, then it is very important to tune into that. Now, there's also a big cluster of energy down there in house four, including the sun and the north node, uh, Chiron and also Mercury and as I mentioned before Mercury goes retrograde later on on the first day. The fourth house in a practical sense is very much about our immediate environment. It's where we live, it can be how we feel about ourselves, our connection to our inner world but also it's very much about our relationship to our parents, our children, our other family members. Most of all, the fourth house is a lot about protectiveness and shelter, security, whether it is in a physical or emotional dimension. So you can see that with the big emphasis on the fourth house, quite feeling, but the sensitivity of your communications, the part of fortune, Venus and Neptune squared up by the moon in the very psychological twelfth house, Yes, you can have lots of chit chat, but it's really how you feel as you go into this month. But the other thing to tell you about, I did briefly mention that Uranus is in a square to the midpoint. But of course, Uranus and Jupiter are going to meet for the first time in 14 years in a conjunction on the 21st of this month. And for you, that is in a very exciting area. So you do have an opportunity to develop your ideas at the start of this month, but with the planet, which is very much to do with the exchange of ideas, Mercury in retrograde, there could be some rethinking. Not everything that you've had in your mind to do may go forwards in quite the way you expect, but that might not necessarily be to your disadvantage, ultimately. But you have got that bright, sparkly energy in House 5 that's going to come back to you later in the month. Now, on the 3rd of the month, Venus moves forwards and connects exactly with Neptune, so the most beautiful of aspects. If you are someone who enjoys the movies, photography, um, or uh, writing, or you're a musician, you could find yourself absolutely on top form 
by the 3rd. But by the 5th, Venus, the planet of relating but also of money, moves out of house 3 and into house 4. Technically debilitated in Aries, but if you've wanted to get some things changed decoratively in your home, Venus is going to give you a lot of thrust over the next few weeks. Venus also forges an alliance to Pluto in Aquarius for the first time in over 200 years. Pluto's in that part of your situation pushing and provoking you to maybe think about your self-worth, your values and your money in a different way. And it's possible that with Venus moving into the fourth house, a much more psychological dimension can start to develop in terms of your self-worth. So if you have been someone who's worked extremely hard and been very careful with resources, you could start to think now about relationships in a new way, even your relationship with yourself. But on the 8th in the Northern Hemisphere and the 9th down south, we have that total solar eclipse. But it's just one minute away from Chiron in the 4th house. Now where Chiron is in your natal chart may be different to the 4th house, nor may it be in Aries. It does actually spend more time in Pisces and Aries than any other zodiac sign. It can spend as little as a year in Virgo or Libra. So a lot of people do have Chiron in Aries. But what I would say in terms of the collective of Capricorn people, whether from an ascendant viewpoint, the sun or the moon, this is an opportunity to really revisit the whole concept of where we get emotional nourishment from. And if you're somebody who is very supportive to others, you know, you've always got time to listen to other people's issues. But when it comes to your stuff, that seems to not get the same amount of support, then this is a really important solar eclipse. It's going to provide a backdrop of energy for the next six months. But if you feel that you're never really taken seriously around the things that are delicate for you, this can be something that you're really going to want to see happen over this next half year. Now Mercury continues to retreat, so it's possible that some arrangements, maybe to do with meeting up or connecting with your family members, may be rejigged. Or if you've got contractors in who are doing some uh, changes to your property, particularly with Venus in the fourth house, uh, decorative changes is entirely possible you may find that someone is somewhat unreliable. But from the 10th through to the 13th, the retreat in Mercury meets the advance in the Sun. They're exact on the 11th. We have a Kazemi. It's an inferior conjunction because Mercury is this side of the Sun in between the Earth. What happens is Mercury sits, as we see it, in the heart of the Sun, and the Sun amplifies Mercury's qualities. But Mercury in the fourth house is very akin to Mercury in Cancer. The emotionality, even though the host is the fiery Aries, the fourth house for you, the emotionality can in some ways blur the rationality that Mercury likes. But this is a, an opportunity to use the drive of the sun to cut through. You know, if you are feeling a bit defensive or oversensitive or a bit prickly, you can start, certainly start to think about that on the 13th as Mercury applies to Chiron itself. From the 14th to the 19th, a magical link between Venus and Mercury. If you do work from home and it hasn't been completely set up in the way that makes it easy for you, you may adapt your space, redecorate it, give you a bit more privacy from the other domestic activities. Then again, it could just be that in a business that you work in, away from home, you can just create your own space in, in, in a more pleasing and productive way. If you have ideas to provide services locally, uh, perhaps working on a part-time basis around childcare or another job, that combination between Mercury and Venus is, can be very, very lucky. Now Venus does go on to apply in a beautiful way to the node on the 17th and Chiron on the 21st. 
If you give to situations your compassion, your personal understanding, your ability to tune into situations in a more emotional way, that will be to your advantage. One of the challenges for you, Capricorn, is that your ruler is Saturn. Saturn is about being very traditional, it's about being very regular, it can be about being very uh, pragmatic about going through the processes, but it can run a little on the cool side. Now, of course, it does depend what house your son's in. If it's in house five, you could be a very bubbly and warm character. It may be that your moon's in a very nurturing uh, sign or house. We can't take it just from the sun alone. But if you feel that there are ways in which you can evolve in terms of your emotional connections, being a bit more vulnerable, opening up to the right people, getting closer to people who can be very good for you. For example, if you've ever considered counselling, this would be a good month to have those sessions because the planets are all conspiring to give you a lot of encouragement to see greater insights that can come from being more emotionally available. But on the 19th, the sun moves into your sister, Earth sign of Taurus. Now, this is very exciting for you ordinarily because the fifth house sees you burst out of the more introspective fourth into the more playful and glamorous fifth. Your physical vitality can pick up and you can really dazzle people with the array of your talents and personality over the following month. What's not to like, particularly with Jupiter and Uranus about to come together in that alliance on the 21st. Well, it's just that as the Sun makes its way into Taurus, it immediately comes into conflict with Pluto. Sun square Pluto is not an easy aspect in astrology. Because if you think about it, the fifth house for you is where you want to really strut your stuff. Whereas Pluto in the second house is asking you to very much be aware of your foundations and in some ways being risk averse with resources. The fifth house is the sector of chance. It's where we want to be pluckier, get stuck into life, just see where it may go. Now, now that's fine if, if you're someone who's a free spirit and you don't have a partner or children and you want to have a more playful part of the month, you can certainly have it in the last 10 days of April. But if you are thinking of splashing the cash, just reminding you at the start of this month, the midpoint in house two, resources was clashing with the more impulsive energies of Uranus house five. So it could be a bit of a desire to do that again, but if you are involved with someone, they may see it very differently and that could create some power battles. The 23rd sees a full moon in the sign of Scorpio, the most intense full moon of the whole year but actually for you a very sociable area, the 11th house, but it too is squaring up with Pluto. I think you're gonna to find towards the end of this month that you may be looking to refine and sift through some of your closest connections. All that fourth house energy earlier in the month may have given you some huge insights about who's really for you and who isn't. Partly because I feel that you're wanting not necessarily just the bright and bubbly connections. You want the ones where you can be truly, authentically yourself from a more personal perspective. And because, although Mercury goes direct on the 24th, which is welcome, it does stay in its post-retrograde shadow through to the 13th of May. Pleasingly, Venus, the planet of love and loot, moves into one of its two ruling signs of Taurus on the 29th, Ordinarily, this would be amazing. It's a great time for you to give yourself a glamorous makeover. Some dates and invitations can certainly come your way as this month draws to a close. But once more, Pluto's been going to push you to evaluate the, the worth of whatever you do, whether it's socially, romantically, uh, playfully. If you do have children, you know, there could be a little bit of... Uh, resistance from them to some of the things you feel they should or should not be doing. By the end of the month, Mars has moved forwards, it does forge a very supporting angle to that Jupiter-Uranus conjunction on the 21st, but then it aligns to Neptune in the sign of Pisces, 
the last few days of this month. That in itself could be a little challenging. If you are traveling anywhere, or you're thinking of buying a new mode of transport or some new tech, make sure you really analyze what you're being told carefully. When Mars and Neptune are interacting in astrology, we can get distortion because Mars is about desire and Neptune can be about unreality. So someone may seem to say all the right things, could be someone you really fancy, but are they going to really stack up for you? You're gonna find out soon enough, early in May, because Mars moves into the sign of Aries, which is the sole domiciliary ruler of, and this is going to bring a lot of spark and extra fire into those home and emotional based issues. But I feel that towards the end of this month, things can be more playful, but you may also become much more conscious of who doesn't really share your values. And I think a lot of the story for the rest of April could be quite surprising about the connections made, the thinking you have, the time you spent working things through, understanding some of the historical elements of your life, perhaps to do with uh, the experiences your parents had, you know, and your relationship to them, and what molded them into being who they are, and how they interacted with you. So some quite deep and very thoughtful stuff can unfold this month, but once Mercury goes direct, there's little doubt with the Sun, Jupiter, Uranus, and then Venus, all in your fifth house, the chances are you're going to want to be so much more sociable and exuberant as this month draws to a close. But Pluto's just saying, just check that the value of what appears to be sparkly and fun really is a value that's worthy of you and your core values. It's been a real pleasure being with you, Capricorn. Thank you so much for joining me. I'd be honored if you would like, comment, share, or subscribe. So Aquarius, on the screen now is your event chart for the very start of the month. The critical piece of information is the position of the moon is late in Sagittarius, the sun at 11 degrees in the sign of Aries. But the midpoint between the two of them is in your sign at 19 degrees. Of course, Pluto's been in Aquarius also since the 21st of January. That midpoint in your first house is pushing you, the balance of the sun and the more empathetic energies of the moon, to really be true to your individuality. But of course, because there's a big set of energy in your third house this month, which is how you communicate, it will be getting across that message which is part of the process that's going to be so important. Now, ironically, your co-ruling planet, your modern ruler of Uranus, is in a square to that midpoint. Someone close to you or something around your family or domestic situation may prove to be somewhat disruptive this month to even your best laid plans. But it could be that you're going to rethink something about where you live and how you live there. Not least, of course, because Jupiter and Uranus come into a conjunction on the 21st, that's exact, for the first time in 14 years. But Mars is going to be prompting them in the sign of Pisces in your second house. And this could see you making some very quick decisions about where you live or adapting where you live if there has been a delay in doing some upgrades to your abode, this can be a time when you can show a lot more urgency, but it could create a little bit of disruption. That's the point. Sometimes there has to be, what is the saying? You have to break some eggs in order to make an omelet. Now, the other thing that's notable about the start of this month is the moon position is in the very friendly for you, Sagittarius, which like the sign of Aquarius, appreciate some freedom and space. But that moon is in an exact square with Neptune in Pisces, and that's going to bring a lot of sensitivity to certain friendships and associations. There may be someone, or even a good cause, that you're very committed to, but it's going to be important that if you help someone financially, they are going to get the benefit. So if someone's giving you a narrative that reaches into your compassion, 
do be sure that it is for the right reasons. At a more practical level, it's possible that one friend may just become a little bit more clingy around you this month and also have a tendency to assume that you can always bail them out from any of their financial situations and that's something that you may need to set a boundary around. But Venus and the part of fortune are in your second house exactly conjunct at the start of this month. Now they're being squared off by the moon as well so as long as you're not too idealistic I think that finances can improve for you this month. Not least that Mars is going to give you a lot of thrust and determination to overcome that more restrictive energies of Saturn that's really been squeezing your everyday finances over the last year. Now I mentioned in my introduction about the North Node and the Sun. And you can see the Sun at 11.45, the Node at 15.37. But by the 5th, they come into an exact conjunction. But by the 3rd, Venus moves forwards and forges an exact alliance with Neptune before moving into Aries on the 5th. And that alliance on the 3rd can be really very spiritual if you're lucky enough to be connected to someone who you really do feel a sense of total unity with. So this is very, very uh, a very very profound influence then it can make you much closer but unfortunately when Venus and Neptune are together we can sometimes uh, kid ourselves to the motives that people have so if there is someone that you're really attracted to just let the dialogue flow so you get a bit more idea of how this is going to unfold because of course on the first of the month Mercury does go into that retrograde it's going to come out of it on the 25th, but in total it's 23 days. It starts the process at 27 degrees and winds back to just inside 16 degrees when it comes to the end, but it's still going to be in a post-retrograde shadow through to the middle of May. So when it comes to technology, your mode of transport, uh, perhaps emails, text messages, all of those need to be handled with great precision and care this month. Because we know Mercury can be a mischief maker in a retrograde, but it can also push us to have a rethink. And the area that you could be rethinking may be about your belief systems, the third house, your connections to neighbours, your interaction with your community. If there have been strains with a sibling, this could be an interesting month because Mercury is not just going to go retrograde, it's going to reconnect to Chiron, also to Venus, because Venus moves into Aries, as I mentioned before, also on the 5th. But the Sun aligning to the North Node is very karmic on the 5th. If there is something you've been thinking about and it's pulling you towards a particular interest or person or to have dialogue, you may find it's very compelling. Now in technical astrology, Venus moving into Aries is detrimented, but it's forging that powerful link to Pluto in your sign. You're gonna find out at this point if a connection with someone, and maybe there's that illusory draw that comes through the conjunction of Venus and Neptune, whether they are in it for real, and you're gonna get a lot of insights around the fifth for sure. But it's on the 8th in the Northern Hemisphere and the 9th in the summer, Southern Hemisphere that we have the total solar eclipse. It's so close to Chiron, it's just one minute apart. So that is really, really rare. And it provides a backdrop of energy for the next six months. Remember the third house is our everyday world. It's our connections. It's our everyday communication can be a bit restless, it's very Gemini-like, certainly gonna give you a lot of curiosity this month, but I feel generally you, despite Mercury's retrograde, are gonna find yourself having a lot more contacts with people. And I think some of those contacts can be going very, very quickly. It can be exhilarating, but at times perhaps also unsettling too. Now, from the 10th to the 13th, but exact on the 11th, Mercury aligns with the Sun and we have 
a Casimion D11. It's an inferior conjunction because of Mercury's retrograde. So Mercury's in between the Sun and Earth. But the Sun still magnifies Mercury. And remember, we can either see Mercury retrograde as something that's absolutely bound to cause a glitch, a problem. So that could be around ticketing. It could be someone doesn't get an email or text message that's important. And it could prove to be very frustrating. But if we take a wider view of it and see that, OK, that's part of its potential. But Mercury retrograde is also an opportunity to look again. So, for example, if you've got lots of old data on your PC, a great time to clean it all off. If you have been labouring away with a very old domestic appliance, trusted as it may be, is it worth continuing to get it patched up and the cost involved with that? So you may think about getting something that's newer and more efficient. And just in general, also you may think about how people perceive you. You know, how do they see the way you interact with them. So you can gain an awful lot of insights this month, particularly on the 13th when Mercury combines with Chiron. If there has been some hurtful exchanges in the past, particularly with a sibling or a neighbour, this can be a point when some healing can go on. Of course, on both sides it would require each person to let go a little bit you're a fixed sign that's not always easy to do for sure and indeed from the 6th to the 15th with Mars applying to Saturn if it is over a point of principle where you feel someone's been unfair it may be very very difficult to put that to one side that can also be a part of the month week two when you're really grappling with those financial issues that Saturn may have created over the last year and trying to unlock some solutions. But the more you can interact and hear other people's ideas or you gain new knowledge or share knowledge that you've got, the better you can do. Indeed, from the 14th through to the 19th, Mercury applies to Venus. This is one of the most glorious of links. Venus in Aries is said to be detrimented the energy and rawness of uh, Venus in Aries is opposite the rulership of Venus of Libra. But I actually really like Venus in Aries because I feel it gives people more passion. This combination, despite Mercury's retrograde, could see a desire to express yourself in an extremely effective way. So do see the Mercury retrograde as a window of opportunity. Now, Venus is also going to be applying to the North Node on the 17th and the 21st. But on the 19th, the Sun moves into your home sector, the 4th house. This is very much about how you feel about things. If there has been a lot of discussion going on earlier in the month, you may, may find yourself wanting to withdraw a little bit and consider what it's all meant, particularly because Pluto is squaring the Sun. This is one of the most challenging of all planetary aspects. If we think Pluto is about power and the Sun is about our core energy, maybe Pluto moving into your sign has emboldened you in some ways that you really want to live in your own authority, your own uh, agency in a much more potent way. And it's possible that someone who's much more akin to working with you as you used to be will want to apply their view of situations in a way that you could resist. Now, of course, we then do have Venus in that conjunction with Uranus, applying to Mars, and it could be a time when you do find a novel solution to a home or emotional or family-based situation. Something could happen very quickly if you're wanting to let or, or rent a, a flat or perhaps buy a property. But also, the full moon comes on the 23rd in the passionate sign of Scorpio. This makes it very difficult for you to disguise your feelings over the following two weeks. But it does also T-square with Pluto. So because of the position of Scorpio being how you connect to the wider world, and the position of the Sun, Jupiter and Uranus, how you need to protect yourself, just toggle, if you have been uh, showing a much more assertive side of your nature, you will just need to toggle between uh, continue to work with that, but also understanding how that will play out. It's the classic work-life balance full moon. 
if something is a bit out of kilter, you know, you're too caught up professionally or too caught up with those home and emotional and family based issues, then it may cause some frustration with you. But on the 25th, Mercury goes direct. It's going to come out of its post retrograde shadow on the 13th of May and then move into the sign of Taurus on the 15th of May. But by the 29th of this month, Venus moves into its other home sign of Taurus. But again, clashes with Pluto. So on the 5th of this month, Pluto provides a tremendous amount of drive and, uh, and support for you to have conversations, Venus in the third house, but at the same time express yourself in a very authentic way. But then the Sun on the 19th and Venus on the 29th and also the full Moon on the 23rd can all be challenges to you. If you've been emerging from a period of many years, 16 years since Pluto went into Capricorn, a feeling that the psychological needs of your situation has been something that other people have not been able to respect or understand or be sincere about, you may get some painful reminders at the end of this month that sometimes people just don't seem to understand what makes you tick. Should you then stop trying to express this new identity that Pluto is pushing you to create? Absolutely not. So it may mean if someone can't work with you in the way you're evolving, something around your home or a close or emotional relationship may go through a period of turbulence and change. And if someone really isn't keeping up with you, it may be that you're going to think to move away in some uh, manner. And remember at the start of this month, that midpoint is clashing with Uranus. If your voice is not heard emotionally, you're gonna speak out about it. Now, by the end of this month, Mars applies to Neptune in the second house. Remember at the start of the month, I told you to be a little bit cautious with your generosity with Venus and Neptune and the part of fortune squaring up to the moon in your 11th house. At the end of this month, be cautious around the business situation or financial offer or your own resources will need to be juggled in a very precise way. When Mars applies to Neptune, it is the trickster influence bar none. So you could encounter someone who's not very honest and may offer you something, but there may be some kind of catch which is not completely obvious to you. But I think that this is a month, Aquarius, genuinely one of the most powerful months for a very long time, particularly with that total solar eclipse, to drive forwards the things that you are really excited by, the ideas, the interest you have, uh, the interaction with you, you have with others can be exciting. There can be lots of stimulation, but it is going to be important to measure your words carefully because of the Mercury retrograde. And if someone is resisting your emotional needs towards the end of the month, it is a time when you do need to stand very firmly in your power. It's been a real pleasure being with you, Aquarius. Thank you so much for joining me. Please like, comment, share or subscribe. So Pisces on the screen now, I'm sharing the event chart for the month. And you can see, let's look at the position of Neptune and Venus. Now they're in your first house, so that's very much about your identity. You've got Mars there, which is terrific because Mars rules the first house. So on the face of it, it could give you a big burst of extra vitality. It's just marking your diary for week two, maybe not quite so much vitality, or indeed quite a lot of frustration because during that week, Mars will apply to Saturn. And if something isn't moving quite as quickly as you would like, it could see you feeling somewhat overwhelmed and a little bit exasperated. But that combination between Neptune and Venus can be very magical. If you are a person who's very invested in arts, fashion, music, creativity, performance, well, what a hot combination that is, particularly with the part of fortune very supportive. The catch is that position of the moon. The moon's right at the top of your chart in house 10 in the free-spirited Sagittarius. Now this means it's going to be more difficult to disguise your feelings throughout this month. 
Now that could be in a very positive way. So if you're feeling bubbly and upbeat, people will know. If you're feeling a little bit lesser bullion, they could also know as well. But that moon position, you can see, is in an exact square with Neptune. That combination is a bit like the moon card in Tarot. We can pull the moon card out and think, oh, that's good if we're talking about maybe a baby or where we live or redecoration. It could be a positive, but the moon card often talks about self-doubt and confusion. And I've got to be honest, if you're not completely dialed in to your direction of travel and very firm about your life direction, that can create a degree of uncertainty. And also, maybe you're going to encounter people who seem to be changeable, mysterious, don't really give you the firm answers you want, and that could be in a professional matter. But Jupiter and Uranus are very close together, your other ruler, right at the start of the month. To be honest, they started to tighten up within three degrees during the last days of March, and they're going to be within three degrees through to the first week of May. So... It's, it's a big transit. I think a lot of astrologers are putting a lot of emphasis on it. But let's think about the sign that they're both in. So Uranus is not so good in Taurus. It's in fall. Jupiter quite likes being in Taurus because what Taurus does is slows down Jupiter. Not so much your rulership, which is very spiritual. It's more the rulership of Sagittarius through Jupiter, which can be a bit exaggerated, a bit boasty, um, a bit inclined to promise more than it can realistically deliver. But for you in House 3, it can be to do with your ideas, your mode of communication. And you could, particularly with Mars applying to them by the 21st, and the Sun having moved into your third house on the 19th, really dazzle people with your passion. But let's wind right back to day one. Because you can see in your chart that Mercury is in your second house of everyday finance, but it doesn't have that little RX symbol next to it. And that's because Mercury doesn't go retrograde until later on, on the first day. But it is going to be retracing its steps through to day 25, starting at 27 degrees and going back to just within 16. 15 degrees and 58 minutes. And that's a big rewind, of course. So it's possible this month you will be revisiting things to do with finances, things to do with the foundations in your life, quite earthy things, things that are quite Taurian, even though for you the energy is housed by the host Aries, which of course is passionate. Mercury in Aries, for example, can be quite impatient, but it can be very direct if you need to discuss a financial matter. So Mercury here would see you want to engage with it, you know, as quickly as you possibly can. But it may be that some information you need to get could, uh, could be slow to come to you because of the retrograde. There may be some obstacles that are going to come up that are not ideal, but we have to see mercury retrogrades as a window of opportunity there are people because the whole mercury retrograde uh, period takes nine and a half to sometimes 10 weeks there are people who think that you should do nothing but sit on your hands during a mercury retrograde i've even had people write to me and say uh, i love your work love your videos i want a live review uh, a one-to-one but Mercury's retrograde at the moment. I'll be in such later. Fine, that's absolutely fine. But what about the other alternative perspective that Mercury retrograde in house two could be a good time to actually scrutinize your approach to finances or also your values? Because the second house isn't just about everyday money and it's also about our self-worth. So you could find yourself, particularly with Chiron, in the sign of Aries, your second house, think about just how much you value yourself. So that can be a big part of this month's story. But I just want to take you back to that event chart at the start of the month, because can you see just above Mars there, there's the icon of the moon and the sun. That's the midpoint. The moon's at 2745, the sun is at 1145. 
We add them together, divide them by two. That's the balance, the yin yang of this chart. This is the same for everyone. Everyone has the midpoint in Aquarius at 19 degrees, but for you it's in the 12th house. And if you look at that position of Uranus at 20 degrees 47, and I think you're going to find a lot of astrologers put an awful lot of emphasis on Jupiter's conjunction with Uranus, but we're drilling deeper here. So it means that 12th house energy, Aquarius, particularly with Pluto there, something could come up this month that at the start of the month you're not aware of. It could be a piece of information. It could be someone's, to be honest, enmity, because the 12th house can be in traditional astrology, secret enemies. It may be someone doesn't have your best interests at heart. Maybe you need to do some scratching back to really understand the true dimensions of some of the influences that are going to unfold this month. So just be aware that you could feel a bit restless with your own squaring up to the midpoint in the 12th house on edge as much as all the attention will go on the fact that Venus is combining with Neptune at the start of this month which is magical undoubtedly and Jupiter's combining with Uranus in your third house magical undoubtedly there are more subtle influences that we must be mindful of particularly with Pluto in your 12th house because you're going to go on a crash course particularly from the 18th of November this year when Pluto moves back into Aquarius after its brief hiatus back into Capricorn from the 2nd of September that's going to go on for some years and it is very much about the psychological domain. If you're someone, for example, who really, everything's fine with me. No, I'd cleared up all that stuff in the past. Um, you know, I don't have any baggage at all. Um, if that's your approach to life, Pluto, to be honest, could catch you out a little bit. If you're someone who's much more invested in personal development and working as a human being, like we all are, in a very humble way, then you're going to be able to embrace the power of Pluto very successfully. But it's if you don't feel that you have any vulnerabilities or you don't have any potential challenges coming to you from others. If only life was that simple. We do live in a very complex world. And of course, one of the most complex areas is that a lot of information gets shared digitally, which is governed by Uranus in the third house, very Gemini. So some information could come into the domain for you personally this month that could surprise you. I think once you've got over the shock, you can work with it in a really positive way. But let's revisit right at the start of the month. So Mercury goes retrograde later on on the first, but on the third, Venus, exalted in your sign, applies to Neptune in a magical way. And as I say, if you are a creative, you can really dazzle someone with your brilliance at this time. Another great piece of news to tell you, however, is that Venus soon moves on and that a light in Aries on the 5th. Now, you may think, oh, it's essential dignity, it's detrimented. I like Venus in Aries. I think it's important to challenge the essential dignities. Yes, work with them. For example, you've had Venus in your sign where she is exalted, but she did apply to Saturn on the 21st. Well, that's one of the toughest influences possible. Just because she's in your sign and exalted doesn't take away that influence. So on the 5th, Venus moves into your sector of everyday money. So the fact that Mercury has gone retrograde is potentially challenging, but along comes Venus to give you a boost. And it may be that if you have been showcasing your brilliant talents, you're gonna get uh, messages of appreciation, people are going to salute your talents, but you could get an uptick around your finances. Also, you may be staggered to know, or get to know, you may not even find out about this immediately, but in due course, perhaps in future years to come, someone may make some kind of allowance for you in an estate or a will at this time. But as I say, they may not tell you. Because Venus is applying to Pluto in your 12th house in a very positive way. The other thing about Pluto in the 12th house 
If you've been working your absolute socks off over the last 16 years, the 11th house, connecting with people, being supportive in your community, doing a job that you had to put a lot of yourself into, being very sacrificing, being very caring to person kind, it can come back to you in a karmic way, very, very powerfully on that particular aspect, which to be honest, hasn't happened for over 220 years in these two signs together. The other karmic part of the fifth is the advancing sun meets the retreating north node. The north node, since the 13th of July 2023, has been asking you to be more conscious of what your core values are. The north node is very much to do with our direction collectively of travel. Your personal north node may not be in Aries and it may not also be in the second house. So this is very much about the collective as you being an ascendant sun or moon in Pisces. But the suggestion here is that you could find yourself pulled in a particular way towards earning money or valuing yourself or valuing certain elements of life. For example, the second house is very much to do with agriculture. It's very Taurian, but the North Node is that inner pull. So if you've got an inner voice pulling you mesmerically towards some kind of new way of doing things, that's the North Node meeting with the Sun. So the fifth is a hugely important part of this month, despite the fact that Mercury retrograde is asking you to be very precise if you're doing on any online transactions. It may be that something that you've applied worth to is not as valuable as you thought. And it could be an attitude, a core idea. Maybe uh, you've got some savings or some possessions and you can change your relationship to them. Which brings us to the total solar eclipse of the 8th in the north and ninth in the southern hemisphere, which is within one degree of Chiron. What a great time to think about your self-worth. If your self-worth is really robust, you have no worries about it, you feel very secure in your identity, that's absolutely brilliant, and I really, really mean that. And this can be an opportunity for you to really go forwards over the next six months and be very successful when it comes to marshalling your resources. But remember, from the 6th through to the 15th, Mars in your sign applies to Saturn in your sign. If there is anything to do with an inner resistance about your direction of travel, you're not quite sure that you're on the right track or the creative or business idea you've got is not necessarily receiving all the plaudits or even the funding that you want, there could be a sense that things are against you. Keep the faith because from the 10th through to the 13th, the advancing sun meets the retreat in Mercury. It's exact on the 11th when we have a Kazemi. It's an inferior conjunction because Mercury is this side of the sun, but the sun still amplifies Mercury. So if you do need to analyze the Virgo energies of Mercury or think quickly the Gemini energies of Mercury or have a conversation Gemini or appraise something and see where the benefits are very Virgo so a great opportunity to really examine something very precisely 13th Mercury applies to Chiron is your thinking self-limiting in some ways are you setting yourself up for things not to work out quite as well for you because in some way or another you've decided or someone put an idea in your head Mercury, how you think that you weren't quite as valuable as you actually are. So a good time to, to think of that again. Your finances can take another turn for the better from the 14th to the 19th, exact on the 19th, where Mercury and Venus meet, one of the luckiest of all planetary aspects. Also, Venus applies to the node on the 17th, another absolute corker for fortune, and to the position of Chiron on the 21st. Again, it's about finding within you that sense of worth. But that does bring us to the 19th. And this could be somewhat of a challenge in time. And the challenge goes on, to be honest, to the 23rd, because the Sun 
applies to Pluto in a square, but actually the sun for you is in house three, which is quick. You know, life will speed up. You're going to want to be more interactive. You're moving towards that bubbly conjunction between Jupiter and Uranus, which is also supported by Mars in your sign. What's not to like? It's Pluto, I'm afraid. So remember that midpoint at the start of this month in Aquarius at 19 degrees, squaring up with Uranus in your third house. 312 energy can see things that have been simmering in the background come into the open. If you told someone, for example, something in confidence in the past, but you're not so much on good terms now, and they feel that they can leverage that information, it's possible that they will. So this could be to do with someone at work who maybe is a little bit of a competitor or a rival, or in a situation where you need to be more combative. Unfortunately, if someone does know something about you which is not so great, they could be tempted to reveal it, or perhaps you're gonna find it more difficult to keep a confidence close to your chest. But generally speaking, Pluto in the 12th house is deep buried stuff. If there is deep buried stuff within you, someone may make an observation, third house, even quite innocently, oh, uh, do you realize that you tend to respond in this way? And you may be staggered by their observation, but actually it could be pouring light through that communication into something that is a little bit in the dark, something that's more hidden, a shadow side of your nature. Now you can choose to feel threatened by the square with Pluto between the sun, or you can choose to embrace it. I would suggest the latter. By the 23rd, the full moon in the passionate Scorpio, your sister water sign, sets up a 3-9 full moon, the third house of the sun, Jupiter, and of course also uh, Uranus, in an opposition with the moon in deep Scorpio, but again T-squared by Pluto. So it's going to be a lot more conversation towards the end of this month. Maybe you're going to let some things come up, let some things go. Maybe things that you've held very deeply within you, some resentments, some unhappinesses, some judgments. If there is someone who doesn't respect you, you could give them a full volley in the last part of this month, particularly with Mercury going direct on the 25th, but then Venus moves to join up with the Sun, Jupiter and Uranus in the sign of Taurus, which is brilliant for you in terms of being chatty, vivacious, flirty. But 312, again, a secret could come into the open. Something that you've been feeling, someone, something someone else has been feeling. The best way to deal with this energy, genuinely, particularly with Mars applying to Neptune towards the end of this month, is to be really prepared to see that with Pluto in your 12th house, transitions are just going to be part of the process. You are going to shift enormously. Although your sign is one of the most compassionate of signs, and you can really give to people beyond what any other sign will consider, sometimes the biggest problem is that you give so much, you end up being hugely resentful about that and then feel like, like you're running on empty. What Pluto's asking you to do is become much more aware of your gift of giving, but also don't give it away to the wrong people. Whether it's verbal support, whether it's emotional support, whether it's through work, there has to be a boundary where you protect yourself. And that's about your thinking. But you can see with all the second house energy this month, a lot of it is based on how good you feel about yourself or not. It could be in a more practical way about finances, but I think it's about self-worth. So the big part of this month's adventure is about strengthening your self-worth. And in the last phase of the month, really enjoying interacting with people in a very bubbly way, but just be aware of the more psychological domain because that is hugely going to grow from here on in. It's been a real pleasure being with you, Pisces. Thank you so much for joining me. Please do check out my weekly in-depth forecast for each of the 12 signs, including Aries. But for now, please like, comment, share, or subscribe.